or ways to say you're confused. Have you ever been so confused you didn't know what to do or say? If so, you might find these words helpful. If you're shocked by something, you can say you are flabbergasted. No one knows where this word comes from, but it might come from aghast, which means horrified. So if you got home and found that everything you own had been stolen, you might say, I'm flabbergasted that they were able to steal everything without being seen. If something is very complicated and confusing, you can say you are bewildered. This word probably comes from to wilder, an old word that means to make someone become lost. So if the police were not able to find out anything about what happened, they might say, we're bewildered. We have no idea who took your things. Another word that could be used is flummoxed, which also means confused. People don't know for sure, but it may have come from flummox, an old word that meant to make untidy or confused. So you could say to the police, I'm just as flummoxed as you are. I can't understand how they could have stolen everything. If something is difficult to understand, you can say it's perplexing or makes you feel perplexed. So the police might say, I'm sorry, but we might not be able to find your things. This is a very perplexing case. Where do America's millionaires live? Nearly 6% of Americans are millionaires. And where they live might surprise you. Finance company, Kiplinger, teamed up with Phoenix Marketing International to find out where exactly America's millionaires are located. The Bridgeport, Stamford, Norwalk area of Connecticut takes the top spot. About 9% of its residents, 31,506 of the people who live there are millionaires. Not only is this part of Connecticut close to New York City. It's also home to a number of important companies. The California region of San Jose Sunnyvale and Santa Clara, which includes Silicon Valley, comes in second with 61,264 millionaire households. 9% of all households. The area is home to some of the biggest tech companies in the world, including Google, Apple, and Facebook. The nation's capital takes the third spot, Washington, D.C., and its 
suburbs attract highly educated Americans looking for well-paid jobs. The 206,361 millionaire households in the region make up 8.9% of DC's 2.3 million households. All of the places in the top 10 are located on the U.S. East or West Coasts, except for Hawaii, which comes in at number 10. Tourism is Hawaii's main industry, and that is not necessarily going to build wealth for people who are employed in that industry, says David Thompson, who is with Phoenix Marketing International. But it's an industry that attracts the individuals that can afford to live there on a full or part-time basis. Where do America's millionaires live? Nearly 6% of Americans are millionaires and where they live might surprise you. Finance company Kiplinger teamed up with Phoenix Marketing International to find out where exactly America's millionaires are located. The Bridgeport, Stanford, Norwalk area of Connecticut takes the top spot. About 9% of its residents, 31,506 of the people who live there are millionaires. Not only is this part of Connecticut close to New York City, it's also home to a number of important companies. The California region of San Jose, Sunnyvale, and Santa Clara, which includes Silicon Valley, comes in second with 61,264 millionaire households, 9% of all households. The area is home to some of the biggest tech companies in the world, including Google, Apple, and Facebook. The nation's capital takes the third spot. Washington, D.C. and its suburbs attract highly educated Americans looking for well-paid jobs. The 206,361 millionaire households in the region make up 8.9% of DC's 2.3 million households. All of the places in the top 10 are located on the US East or West Coast, except for Hawaii, which comes in at number 10. Tourism in, is Hawaii's main industry, and that is not necessarily going to build wealth people who are employed in that industry, says David Thompson, who is with Phoenix Marketing International. But it's an industry that attracts the individuals that can afford to live there on a full or part-time basis. A study has found which countries around the world drink the most and least milk, fruit juice, and sugary drinks. Published in June in the journal Current Developments in Nutrition. The study found that people in Mexico drank 
the most sugary drinks with the average person drinking over half a liter per day. And that's after the country introduced a tax on sugary drinks in 2014. Over 70% of Mexicans are overweight. Suriname and Jamaica were the next two highest drinkers of sugary drinks. The countries that drank the least were China, Indonesia, and Burkina Faso. Colombia drank the most fruit juice at an average of 325 milliliters per day, followed by the Dominican Republic at an average of almost 300 milliliters. The countries that drank the least juice were China, Portugal, and Japan. People in Sweden drank the most milk, more than 295 milliliters per day on average. Next were Iceland and Finland at more than 265 milliliters. China, Togo, and Sudan drank the least milk around the world. Adults drank an average of almost 86 milliliters of sugary drinks each day. People of all ages drank about 45 milliliters of juice and 92 milliliters of milk. People in Asia drank about one-tenth as much fruit juice and sugary drinks as people in Latin America and only half as much milk as the global average. The lead author of the study, Laura Lara Castor, says she hopes that the information will help different countries improve their diet and health. What people drink around the world. A study has found which countries around the world drink the most and least milk, fruit juice, and sugary drinks. Published in June, in the journal Current Developments in Nutrition, the study found that people in Mexico drank the most sugary drinks, with the average person drinking over half a liter per day. 
and that's after the country introduced a tax on sugary drinks in 2014. Over 70% of Mexicans are overweight. Suriname and Jamaica were the next two highest drinkers of sugary drinks. The countries that drank the least were China, Indonesia, and Burkina Faso. Colombia drank the most fruit juice at an average of 325 milliliters per day, followed by the Dominican Republic at an average of almost 300 milliliters. The countries that drank the least juice were China, Portugal, and Japan. People in Sweden drank the most milk. More than 295 milliliters per day on average. Next were Iceland and Finland at more than 265 milliliters. China, Togo, and Sudan drank the least milk. Around the world, adults drank an average of almost 86 milliliters of sugary drinks every day. People of all ages drank about 45 milliliters of juice and 92 milliliters of milk. People in Asia drink about one-tenth as much fruit juice and sugary drinks as people in Latin America, and only half as much milk as the global average. The lead author of the study, Laura Laracaster, says she hopes that the information will help different countries improve their diet and health. Japanese employee sues ASICS over paternity leave. Japanese companies value loyalty, long hours, and not taking vacations, especially among male employees. But now an ASICS employee is suing his company after receiving poor treatment when he returned from paternity leave. It is one of the country's first lawsuits over paternity harassment or Patahara, as it is known in Japan. The ASICS employee says he was punished for taking paternity leave after each of his two sons was born. He asked not to be named because he is afraid of further punishment. His sons are now four and one. At first, the man was meeting athletes as part of his work in the sales and marketing department at ASICS. But according to his lawsuit, he was suddenly sent to a warehouse after his first paternity leave in 2015. After he hurt his shoulder, he was given odd jobs like translating employee policies into English, even though he has minimal foreign language skills. He reports to no one. 
he wants his original job back and 4.4 million yen or about $41,000 in damages. ASICS said it plans to fight the lawsuit in court, adding that it was regrettable no agreement could be reached. Japanese law guarantees both men and women up to one year of leave from work after a child is born. Parents aren't guaranteed pay from their companies, but they can get money from the government. Worried about the country's low birth rate, the government is even considering making parental leave mandatory. However, only 6% of fathers currently take paternity leave, according to government data. More than 80% of working women take maternity leave, though that's after about half quit to get married or have a baby. Makoto Yoshida of Ritsumika University says it will take decades for paternity leave to be accepted in Japan. He says that a boss is likely to think a worker who takes paternity leave is useless. And once an office sees a worker getting bad treatment for taking paternity leave, no one else is going to want to do it, Yoshida says. Japanese employee sues ASICS over paternity leave. Japanese companies value loyalty, long hours, and not taking vacations, especially among male employees. But now an ASIC employee is suing his company after receiving poor treatment when he returned from paternity leave. It is one of the country's first lawsuits over paternity harassment, or patahara as it is known in Japan. The ASICS employee says he was punished for taking paternity leave after each of his two sons was born. He asked not to be named because he is afraid of further punishment. His sons are now four and one. At first, the man was meeting athletes as part of his work in the sales and marketing department at ASICS. But according to his lawsuit, he was suddenly sent to a warehouse after his first paternity leave in 2015. After he hurt his shoulder, he was given odd jobs like translating employee policies into English, even though he has minimal foreign language skills. He reports to no one. He wants his original job back and 4.4 million yen, or about $41,000 in damages. ASIC said it plans to fight the lawsuit in court, adding that it was regrettable no agreement could be reached. Japanese law guarantees both men and women up to one year of leave from work 
after a child is born. Parents aren't guaranteed pay from their companies, but they can get money from the government. Worried about the country's low birth rate, the government is even considering making paternity leave mandatory. However, only 6% of fathers currently take paternity leave, according to government data. More than 80% of working women take maternity leave, though that's after about half quit to get married or have a baby. Makoto Yoshida of University says it will take decades for paternity leave to be accepted in Japan. He says that a boss is likely to think a worker who takes paternity leave is useless. And once an office sees a worker getting bad treatment for taking paternity leave, no one else is going to want to do it, Yoshida says. Photos banned in some Kyoto alleys. Tourists in Kyoto, Japan may now be fined 10,000 yen or about $90 if they take photos in certain alleys. Hanamakoji Street is the main street in Jian, a traditional area of Kyoto that is known for its stone streets, old tea shops, bars, and restaurants. The area is very popular among tourists looking to take photos. However, an association of residents and shop owners has decided to ban photography in privately owned alleys near Hanamakoji Street after visitors started entering them without permission. Signs now warn visitors about the ban. Association members also handed out leaflets telling visitors to ask for permission before taking photos of the areas, geishas, and makos. There had been complaints that people had been taking photos of geishas without asking, and even chasing them and pulling at their kimonos. In 2017, Kyoto also made a guide explaining good manners for visitors to the city. It warned tourists not to tip, not to bother geishas, and not to ride a bicycle drunk, among other things. Kyoto has had problems with over-tourism as the number of people visiting Japan has risen from 8 million in 2008 to 31 million in 2019.
2018. More than 1.2 million foreign travelers stayed at major hotels in the city in 2018, up 5% from the year before. Kyoto isn't the only Japanese city having trouble with over-tourism. In March, Kamakura, a traditional city about 90 minutes south of Tokyo, passed a law asking people not to eat while walking in places popular with tourists. Locals didn't like their clothes getting dirty when they walked past tourists holding food, and they were unhappy with garbage on the streets. Photos banned in some Kyoto alleys. Tourists in Kyoto, Japan may now be fined 10,000 yen or about $90 if they take photos in certain alleys. Hanamikochi Street is the main street in Gion a traditional area of Kyoto that is known for its stone streets, old tea shops, bars, and restaurants. The area is very popular among tourists looking to take photos. However, an association of residents and shop owners has decided to ban photography in privately owned alleys near Hanamikochi Street after visitors started entering them without permission. Signs now warn visitors about the ban. Association members also handed out leaflets telling visitors to ask for permission before taking photos of the area's geishas and nekos. There had been complaints that people had been taking photos of geishas without asking and even chasing them and pulling at their kimonos. In 2017, Kyoto also made a guide explaining good manners for visitors to the city. It warned tourists not to tip, not to bother geishas, and not to ride a bicycle drunk, among other things. Kyoto had, has had problems with over-tourism as the number of people visiting Japan has risen from 8 million in 2008 to 31 million in 2018. More than 1.2 million foreign travelers stayed at major hotels in the city in 2018, up 5% from the year before. Kyoto isn't the only Japanese city having trouble with over-tourism. In March, Kamakura, a traditional city about 90 minutes south of Tokyo, passed a law asking people not to eat while walking in places popular with tourists. Locals didn't like their clothes getting dirty when they walked past tourists holding food, and they were unhappy with garbage on the streets. Impossible Foods unveils plant-based pork sausage. Following a big year for its plant-based burger, Impossible Foods has unveiled two new products, Impossible Pork and Impossible Sausage. Like the Impossible Burger, Impossible Foods, Pork and Sausage are made from soy, but taste and feel like ground meat. Impossible pork will first be sold in restaurants.
while 139 Burger King restaurants in five U.S. cities will start selling impossible sausage in late January. Impossible Foods has not said when the products will be sold in grocery stores. The company only recently began selling its burgers in grocery stores. Although they're available at more than 17,000 restaurants in the U.S., Singapore, Hong Kong, and Macau. Health, animal welfare, and environmental concerns are leading to an increase in plant-based meat sales. Impossible Foods CEO Pat Brown said the company produced twice as much of its plant-based meat in the last quarter of 2019 as it did in all of 2018. In the U.S. in 2019, plant-based meat sales increased 10% last year to nearly $1 billion. Traditional meat sales rose 2% to 95 billion dollars over that same time, according to market research company Nielsen. Brown said the company decided pork should be its next product because customers have often asked for it. It's also part of Impossible Foods' plans to expand to other countries such as China, Brown said. Since pork is the most widely consumed meat, worldwide. The company already has plans to sell its products in Europe, but is waiting for official approval. Impossible Foods unveils plant-based pork sausage. Following a big year for its plant-based burger, Impossible Foods has unveiled two new products, Impossible Pork and Impossible Sausage. Like the Impossible Burger, Impossible Foods pork and sausage are made from soy, but taste and feel like ground meat. Impossible Pork will first be sold in restaurants while 139 Burger King restaurants in five U.S. cities will start selling Impossible Sausage in late January. Impossible Foods has not said when the products will be sold in grocery stores. The company only recently began selling its burgers in grocery stores, although they're available at more than 17,000 restaurants in the U.S., Singapore, Hong Kong, and Macau. Health animal welfare, and environmental concerns 
are leading to an increase in plant-based meat sales. Impossible Foods CEO Pat Brown said the company produced twice as much of its plant-based meat in the last quarter of 2019 as it did in all of 2018. In the U.S. in 2019, plant-based meat sales increased 10% last year to nearly $1 billion. Traditional meat sales rose 2% to $95 billion over that same time, according to market research company Nielsen. Brown said the company decided pork should be its next product because customers have often asked for it. It's also part of Impossible Foods' plan to expand to other countries, such as China, Brown said, since pork is the most widely consumed meat worldwide. The company already has plans to sell its products in Europe, but is waiting for official approval. San Francisco cafes say no to disposable cups. Cafes in the U.S. city of San Francisco are replacing disposable coffee cups with everything from glass jars to mugs that can be rented. Chef Dominique Crenn, who owns three-star Michelin restaurant Atelier Crenn, plans to open a San Francisco cafe that will have no to-go bags or disposable coffee cups and won't use any plastic. Customers who want to take their drink away will be told to bring their own cups. The Blue Bottle Coffee Company, which uses about 15,000 to-go cups a month at its 70 U.S. cafes, says it wants to show our guests and the world that cafes can stop using disposable cups. Blue Bottle will stop using paper cups at two of its San Francisco cafes in 2020. Customers ordering coffee to go will have to bring their own cup or pay for a reusable one, which they can keep or return for their money back. We expect to lose some business, said Blue Bottle CEO Brian Meehan. We know some of our guests won't like it, and we're prepared for that. Perch Cafe in Oakland has stopped using paper disposable coffee cups too. Its owner, Kadar Ford, said that its customers can rent a glass jar which they can take with them instead. Ford made the change after his nine-year-old daughter's school was helping to clean a lake near 
his cafe and found its cups in the water. She told him that she shouldn't have to clean her room if he couldn't keep the cups out of the lake. San Francisco cafes say no to disposable cups. Cafes in the U.S. city of San Francisco are replacing disposable coffee cups with everything from glass jars to mugs that can be rented. Chef Dominique Prin, who owns three-star Michelin restaurant Atelier Prin, plans to open a San Francisco cafe that will have no to-go bags or disposable coffee cups and won't use any plastic. Customers who want to take their drink away will be told to bring their own cups. The Blue Bottle Coffee Company, which uses about 15,000 to-go cups a month at its 70 U.S. cafes, says it wants to show our guests and the world that cafes can stop using disposable cups. Blue Bottle will stop using paper cups at two of its San Francisco cafes in 2020. Customers ordering coffee to go will have to bring their own cup or pay for a reusable one, which they can keep or return for their money back. We expect to lose some business, said Blue Bottle CEO Brian Meehan. We know some of our guests won't like it, and we're prepared for that. Perch Cafe in Oakland has stopped using paper disposable coffee cups too. Its owner, Kadar Kaur, said that its customers can rent a glass jar which they can take with them instead. Kaur made the change after his nine-year-old daughter's school was helping to clean a lake near his cafe and found its cups in the water. She told him that she shouldn't have to clean her room if he couldn't keep the cups out of the lake. Top CEOs earn average UK salary in just three days. The CEOs of the companies from the FTSE 100, the largest 100 companies on the London Stock Exchange, will make as much money in three days as the average British worker makes in a full year, according to a new report. Using information from 2018, the Chartered Institute of Personal Development CIPD and the High Pay Center found that the average CEO of a FTSE 100 company makes about $4.5 million a year or about $1,182 an hour. That's 117 times more than the average British worker who makes $38,757 a year or $18.84 an hour. Top CEOs are being paid less than the previous year when their average salary was about $5.1 million. However, that only means it takes them three days instead of two and a half
days to make the average employee's salary. The report said the large difference between the pay of CEOs and employees is likely to become a political issue in 2020. It's the first year that UK companies on the stock exchange with more than 250 workers will have to say how much they pay their CEOs compared to other employees and explain why. Luke Hildred, director of the High Pay Center, said that the high pay of CEOs was helping to make the UK one of the most unequal countries in Europe. Peter Cheese, chief executive at the CIPD, said that companies reporting the pay of their CEOs is just the start and that they need to explain why their CEOs deserve so much more pay than their other employees. Top CEOs earn average UK salary in just three days. The CEOs of the companies from the FTSE 100, the largest 100 companies on the London Stock Exchange, will make as much money in three days as the average British worker makes in a whole year, according to a new report. Using information from 2018, the Chartered Institute of Personal Development CIPD, and the High Pay Center found that the average CEO of a, a FTSE 100 company makes about $4.5 million a year, or about $1,182 an hour. That's 117 times more than the average British worker, who makes $38,757 a year, or $18.84 an hour. Top CEOs are being paid less than the previous year when their average salary was about $5.1 million. However, that only means it takes them three days instead of two and a half days to make the average employee's salary. The report said the large difference between the pay of CEOs and employees is likely to become a political issue in 2020. It's the first year that UK companies on the stock exchange with more than 250 workers will have to say how much they pay their CEOs compared to other employees and explain why. Luke Hilliard, director of the High Pay Center, said that the high pay of CEOs was helping to make the UK one of the most unequal countries in Europe. Peter Cheese, chief executive at the CIPD, said that companies reporting the pay of their CEOs is just the start, and that they need to explain why their CEOs deserve so much more pay than their other employees. Fortnite player pays mothers student loan. Professional U.S. Fortnite player Aiden Conrad has paid off all of his mother's 
student loan debt. He called his mother to tell her the news during a live video on Twitch, a popular streaming website. In the call, Conrad tells his mother that he has a late Christmas present for her. I don't need anything, Aiden. You've done enough for me, she says. But Conrad tells her it's too late. Your school loans are all paid for. You don't have to worry about them. His mother is so happy that she begins to cry. Conrad then said it was thanks to his over 1.4 million followers on Twitch, some of whom donate money or pay to subscribe to his channel. His mother says, oh, I love them, and then tells them all to subscribe to his channel, making Conrad laugh. It's not known how large Conrad's mother's student loan was. However, the size of an average student loan in the U.S. is about $28,000. At 20 years old, Conrad has already made more than $160,000 from Fortnite competitions. That includes his prize money from the first ever Fortnite World Cup last year, where he won $50,000 for finishing 37th in the duos tournament and $10,000 for finishing 13th in the Celebrity Pro-Am Tournament. Conrad says on his Twitch page that everyone in his family plays games. So he grew up loving to play them too. He plays Fortnite most often, but in the future, he hopes to make money by streaming himself playing other games as well. Fortnite player pays mother's student loan. Professional U.S. Fortnite player Aiden Conrad has paid off all of his mother's student loan debt. He called his mother to tell her the news during a live video on Twitch, a popular streaming website. In the call, Conrad tells his mother that he has a late Christmas present for her. I don't need anything, Aiden. You've done enough for me, she says. But Conrad tells her it's too late. Your school loans are all paid for. You don't have to worry about them. His mother is so happy that she begins to cry. Conrad then said it was thanks to his over 1.4 million followers on Twitch, some of whom donate money or pay to subscribe to his channel. 
his mother says, oh, I love them, and then tells them all to subscribe to his channel, making Conrad laugh. It's not known how large Conrad's mother's student loan was. However, the size of an average student loan in the U.S. is about $28,000. At 20 years old, Conrad has already made more than $160,000 from Fortnite competitions. That includes his prize money from the first ever Fortnite World Cup last year, where he won $50,000 for finishing 37th in the duos tournaments, and $10,000 for finishing 13th in the Celebrity Pro-Am tournament. Conrad says on his Twitch page that everyone in his family plays games, so he grew up loving to play them too. He plays Fortnite most often but in the future he hopes to make money by streaming himself playing other games as well. Living Machines Created for First Time Scientists from the University of Vermont, UVM, and Tufts University in the U.S. have created Living Machines made using cells from frogs. They are able to move around, heal themselves when injured, and may be able to carry things. The living machines are a completely new type of organism co-leader of the research, Professor Josh Bongard from UVM said, they're neither a traditional robot nor a known species of animal. The living machines are called Xenobots. The name comes from Xenopus Levis, the scientific name of the frog from which the skin and heart cells used to create them was taken. The xenobots are about one millimeter wide and were designed by Deep Green, a supercomputer at UVM. Researchers asked the computer to design new life forms that could do a specific thing, like move in one direction, and the computer would create thousands of designs. The best designs were then chosen and refined, then given to the team at Tufts University to be built. Once built, the xenobots were put in water where they moved around with some even organizing themselves into groups and moving together. The xenobots were built with their own food supply, which allowed them to live for about a week before it ran out. Future xenobots made from mammal cells could live on dry land. The Researchers say that the 
xenobots could be used to replace technology that is normally made from steel, concrete, or plastic, making them more environmentally friendly. This is because when they stop working, they break down instead of leaving behind pollution. When they're done with their job, after seven days, they're just dead skin cells, said Bongard. The xenobots could have many uses, like cleaning up pollution, delivering drugs inside the human body, and helping us better understand how living things work. The aim is to understand the software of life, said Levin. Living Machines Created for First Time Scientists from the University of Vermont, UVM, and Tufts University in the U.S. have created living machines. Made using cells from frogs, they are able to move around, heal themselves when injured, and may be able to carry things. The living machines are a completely new type of organism. Co-leader of the research, Professor Josh Bongard from UVM said, they're neither a traditional robot nor a known species of animal. The living machines are called xenobots. The name comes from Xenopus levis, the scientific name of the frog from which the skin and heart cells used to create them was taken. The xenobots are about one millimeter wide and were designed by Deep Green, a supercomputer at UVM. Researchers asked the computer to design new life forms that could do a specific thing, like move in one direction. And the computer would create thousands of designs. The best designs were then chosen and refined, then given to the team at Tufts University to be built. Once built, the xenobots were put in water where they moved around with some even organizing themselves into groups and moving together. The xenobots were built with their own food supply, which allowed them to live for about a week before it ran out. Future xenobots, made from mammal cells, could live on dry land. The researchers say that the xenobots could be used to replace technology that is normally made from steel, concrete or plastic, making them more environmentally friendly. This is because when they stop working, they break down instead of leaving behind pollution. When they're done with their job after seven days, they're just dead skin cells, said Bongard. The xenobots could have many uses, like cleaning up pollution, delivering drugs inside the human body, and helping us better understand how living things work. The aim is to understand the software of life, said Levin. Cruise builds car with no steering wheel or gas pedal. A self-driving electric car with no gas pedal, brake pedal, or steering wheel has been built by Cruise, a company owned by General Motors GM. Honda also supported development of the car, 
called Origin, which was introduced at an event in San Francisco in late January. Origin isn't really a car, but a shuttle. It has large sliding doors, allowing two people to get in or out at the same time. Inside, there is no driver's seat, but instead there are seats for up to six passengers who sit facing each other. Customers won't be able to buy the vehicle, but they will be able to use an app to call one, just like using Uber. When the vehicle arrives, the customer uses a code to enter, and the vehicle's sensors can tell when someone gets in or whether they have put on their seat belt. GM executives say they want Origins to be able to run 18 hours a day, reducing the need for people to own their own cars. However, GM and Cruise didn't say when customers would be able to use the Origin. Kyle, both of Cruise told CNN Business only that the vehicle would be available pretty soon. Cruise had planned to start a self-driving taxi service by the end of 2019, but in July it announced that the plan was being delayed. Waymo, which is owned by Google's parent company, Alphabet, has been running self-driving taxis in Chandler, Arizona since 2018. But until October, there was always a safety driver in the car, ready to take over in case of emergency. Even now, only some Waymo rides are passenger only. Cruise builds car with no steering wheel or gas pedal. A self-driving electric car with no gas pedal, brake pedal, or steering wheel has been built by Cruise, a company owned by General Motors, GM. Honda also supported development of the car, called Origin, which was introduced at an event in San Francisco in late January. Origin isn't really a car, but a shuttle. It has large sliding doors, allowing two people to get in or out at the same time. Inside, there is no driver's seat, but instead there are seats for up to six passengers who sit facing each other. Customers won't be able to buy the vehicle, but they will be able to use an app to call one, just like using Uber. When the vehicle arrives, the customer uses a code to enter, 
and the vehicle's sensors can tell when someone gets in or whether they have put on their seatbelt. GM executives say they want Origins to be able to run 18 hours a day, reducing the need for people to own their own cars. However, GM and Cruise didn't say when customers would be able to use the Origin. Kyle Vogt of Cruise told CNN Business only that the vehicle would be available pretty soon. Cruise had planned to start a self-driving taxi service by the end of 2019, but in July it announced that the plan was being delayed. Waymo, which is owned by Google's parent company Alphabet, has been running self-driving taxis in Chandler, Arizona since 2018. But until October, there was always a safety driver in the car, ready to take over in case of emergency. Even now, only some Waymo rides are passenger only. EU may require one charger for all devices. Members of the European Parliament have asked the European Commission to require all portable electronic devices to use a single common charger. A common charger should fit all mobile phones, tablets, ebook readers, and other portable devices, said Alex Aegeus Saliba, a member of European Parliament. Old device chargers create more than 51,000 metric tons of waste in the EU every year. The European Commission has been campaigning for a common charger since 2009. When there were more than 30 different types of chargers on the market. At the time, Apple, Samsung, and Nokia agreed to make a charger that worked with all devices. However, Apple did not actually make a different charger and only made an adapter available. In 2012, Apple introduced its lightning connector along with the iPhone 5, replacing the connector that had been used since the first iPhone in 2007. The EU tried to get a common charger again in 2014, but Apple said its devices were too slim to use the USB-C chargers used by Android phones, and that it would cost up to $2 billion to meet the EU's request. The main chargers in the EU are now USB-C, micro USB, and Apple's Lightning. According to Apple, more than one billion devices that use the Lightning connector were made. 
Apple says that a common charger would cause problems for customers and make it harder to create new products. However, the company has already begun to use USB-C chargers on its iPad and MacBook and may also use them on the iPhone 12. At the same time, companies including Apple, Huawei, and Samsung have already made wireless chargers for their devices, and some suggest they may choose to use wireless chargers rather than use any type of connector at all. EU may require one charger for all devices. Members of the European Parliament have asked the European Commission to require all portable electronic devices to use a single common charger. A common charger should fit all mobile phones, tablets, e-book readers, and other portable devices, said Alex Agius Saliba, a member of European Parliament. Old device chargers create more than 51,000 metric tons of waste in the EU every year. The European Commission has been campaigning for a common charger since 2009 when there were more than 30 different types of chargers on the market. At the time, Apple, Samsung, and Nokia agreed to make a charger that worked with all devices. However, Apple did not actually make a different charger and only made an adapter available. In 2012, Apple introduced its lightning connector along with the iPhone 5 replacing the connector that had been used since the first iPhone in 2007. The EU tried to get a common charger again in 2014, but Apple said its devices were too slim to use the USB-C chargers used by Android phones, and that it would cost up to $2 billion to meet the EU's request. The main chargers in the EU are now USB-C, micro USB, and Apple's Lightning. According to Apple, more than 1 billion devices that use the Lightning connector were made. Apple says that a common charger would cause problems for consumers and make it harder to create new products. However, the company has already begun to use USB-C chargers on its iPad and MacBook, and may also use them on the iPhone 12. At the same time, companies including Apple, Huawei, and Samsung have already made wireless chargers for their devices, and some suggest they may choose to use wireless charging rather than use any type of connector at all. How to be successful at online dating. A 2019 study found that online dating is now the most popular way for people in the U.S. to find partners. So if you're more likely to find love through an app than through a friend, what can be done to improve your dating profile. Choose the right pictures. Pictures are how you make your first impression. However, they shouldn't just show 
your good side, but also your personality. Start with your best recent photo, having both a close-up of your face and a full body photo is also a good idea. The rest of your photos should each show a different part of your life, like you enjoying a hobby or having fun on a trip. Avoid using pictures with groups of people because it could be difficult to tell which person is you. The 70-30 rule. A 2014 study found that the most successful dating profiles were those that were 70% about the user and 30% about what they were looking for in a partner. It also found that using simple language and being funny was helpful. Keep your profile updated. Make sure to update your profile often, particularly if there's been a big change in your life. Some dating websites will actually promote your profile more if you update it often. Be honest. Don't lie about important parts of your life. Like if you have kids or pets. If you smoke or where you live. Lies can destroy relationships. And if you're honest, it will be easier to Find someone who likes you for who you really are. How to be successful at online dating. A 2019 study found that online dating is now the most popular way for people in the U.S. to find partners. So if you're more likely to find love through an app than through a friend, what can be done to improve your dating profile? Choose the right pictures. Pictures are how you make your first impression. However, they shouldn't just show your good side, but also your personality. Start with your best recent photo. Having both a close-up of your face and a full body photo is also a good idea. The rest of your photos should each show a different part of your life, like you enjoying a hobby or having fun on a trip. Avoid using pictures with groups of people because it could be difficult to tell which person is you. The 70-30 rule. A 2014 study found that the most successful dating profiles were those that were 70% about the user and 30% about what they were looking for in a partner. It also found that using simple language and being funny was helpful. Keep your profile updated. Make sure to update your profile often, particularly if there's been a big change in your life. Some dating websites will actually promote your profile more if you update it often. Be honest. Don't lie about important parts of your life, like if you have kids or pets, if you smoke, or where you live. Lies can destroy relationships, 
And if you're honest, it will be easier to find someone who likes you for who you really are. McDonald's to offer rice burgers in Japan. McDonald's will sell burgers with buns made of rice or gohan burgers in its restaurants in Japan from February 5th until mid-May 2020. CNN Business reports that the rice burger buns will be made with rice grown in Japan and soy sauce. There will be three types of rice bun burger for customers to choose from. The bacon lettuce burger, the teriyaki McBurger, and the chicken filet o. The new burgers will be part of the fast food restaurants Night Mac menu, which customers can buy from 5 p.m to closing time. Sora News 24 says that before McDonald's announced the rice burgers, it sent a tweet just saying, ah, I want to eat rice. This got people on the internet trying to guess what it meant, with some thinking that McDonald's was going to put the rice and breaded pork cutlet it sold in the 1990s back on the menu. People didn't know there was going to be a new product, so it created a lot of suspense. Everyone had a lot of hope for what it would be. Kokoro Toyama from McDonald's Japan told CNN Business. Toyama also explained that McDonald's had found out that Japanese people in their 30s and 40s preferred rice to bread with dinner, but still wanted to enjoy the burgers they ate when they were younger. McDonald's isn't the first company to make a rice bun burger. However, Japanese burger restaurant Mos Burger has had one since 1987. McDonald's to offer rice burgers in Japan. McDonald's will sell burgers with buns made of rice or Gohan burgers in its restaurants in Japan from February 5th until mid-May 2020. CNN Business reports that the rice burger buns will be made with rice grown in Japan and soy sauce. There will be three types of rice bun burger for customers to choose from. The bacon lettuce burger, the teriyaki McBurger, and the chicken filet The new burgers will be part of the fast food restaurant's Night Mac menu, which customers can buy from 5 p.m. to closing time. 
Minnesota News 24 says that before McDonald's announced the rice burgers, it sent a tweet just saying, ah, I want to eat rice. This got people on the internet trying to guess what it meant, with some thinking that McDonald's was going to put the rice and breaded pork cutlet it sold in the 1990s back on the menu. People didn't know there was going to be a new product, so it created a lot of suspense. Everyone had a lot of hope for what it would be, Kokoro Toyama from McDonald's Japan told CNN Business. Toyama also explained that McDonald's had found out that Japanese people in their 30s and 40s preferred rice to bread with dinner, but still wanted to enjoy the burgers they ate when they were younger. McDonald's isn't the first company to make a rice bun burger. However, Japanese burger restaurant Most Burger has had one since 1987. Parasite wins Best Picture, makes Oscars history. Bong Joon-ho's Parasite has become the first non-English language film to win Best Picture in the 92-year history of the Academy Awards. International films have usually only been considered in their own category, but in recent years the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences has invited in many more international voters. Still, many had expected Sam Mendez's World War I film, 1917, to win Best Picture. Parasite took Hollywood's top prize as well as awards for Best Director, Best International Film, and Best Screenplay. No Korean film has ever won an Oscar before. Director Bong got standing ovations for his wins on the stage again for Best Director. Hong thanked the other nominees, particularly Martin Scorsese, and ended by saying, Now I'm ready to drink until tomorrow. Even after most people had left the Dolby Theater, the Parasite team stayed on the stage enjoying their win. It's really crazy, Hong told reporters, holding his awards. Parasite also won the Palme d'Or at last year's Cannes Film Festival. All of the acting awards went to the expected winners. Laura Dern for playing a divorce lawyer in Marriage Story. Brad Pitt for playing an old stuntman in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Renee Zellweger for playing Judy Garland in Judy. And Joaquin 
Phoenix for playing the Joker in Joker. However, for the 87th time, no women were among the nominees for Best Director. Some thought that, among others, Greta Gerwig should have been chosen for Little Women and Maddie Diop for Atlantics. Parasite wins Best Picture, makes Oscars history. Bong Joon-ho's Parasite has become the first non-English language film to win Best Picture in the 92-year history of the Academy Awards. International films have usually only been considered in their own category. But in recent years, the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences has invited in many more international voters. Still, many had expected Sam Mendes' World War I film, 1917, to win Best Picture. Parasite took Hollywood's top prize, as well as awards for Best Director, Best International Film, and Best Screenplay. No Korean film has ever won an Oscar before. Director Boon got standing ovations for his wins. On the stage again for Best Director, Bong thanked the other nominees, particularly Martin Scorsese, and ended by saying, Now I'm ready to drink until tomorrow. Even after most people had left the Dolby Theater, the Parasite team stayed on the stage enjoying their win. It's really crazy, Bong told reporters, holding his awards. Parasite also won the Palme d'Or at last year's Cannes Film Festival. All of the acting awards went to the expected winners. Laura Dern for playing a divorced lawyer in Marriage Story, Brad Pitt for playing an old stuntman in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, Renee Zellweger for playing Judy Garland in Judy, and Joaquin Phoenix for playing the Joker in Joker. Toy Story 4 became the 10th Pixar movie to win Best Animated Film, and New Zealand filmmaker Taika Waititi became the first Indigenous director ever to get an Oscar, winning Best Adapted Screenplay for Jojo Rabbit. However, for the 87th time, no women were among the nominees for Best Director. Some thought that, among others, Greta Gerwig should have been chosen for Little Women and Maddie Diop for Atlantics. YouTube got over $15 billion from ads in 2019. Alphabet, which owns Google and a number of other tech companies, has reported that YouTube made $15.1 billion from ads in 2019. This is a growth of 36% from 2018 and 86% since 2017, says CNN. This is the first time that Alphabet has told the public how much money YouTube makes from ads. Before now, YouTube's ad money had just been included in Google's total. Alphabet did not say what YouTube's 2019 profits were. And it did not say how much it paid to YouTubers. However, in a call to investors, Alphabet's Ruth Porat said that the company paid YouTubers 
out of its content acquisition costs, which were around $8.5 billion. Most people make money on YouTube by joining its partner program. They can ask to join when they have at least 1,000 subscribers and people have watched a total of 4,000 hours of their videos in 12 months. If they are accepted, they make money by having ads on their videos. The Verge reports that in the past, YouTubers have not known how much money the company made from the ads on their videos. Some have already been unhappy with how much money their channels get. Now that they know how much money YouTube gets from ads, they may want more. Popular YouTube stars can get millions of dollars a year. The highest paid YouTube star, eight-year-old Ryan Gaji, made $26 million in 2019. However, top stars don't just get money from ads, but also from sponsorships and tours and by selling products. YouTube got over $15 billion from ads in 2019. Alphabet, which owns Google and a number of other tech companies, has reported that YouTube made $15.1 billion from ads in 2019. This is a growth of 36% from 2018 and 86% since 2017, says CNN. This is the first time that Alphabet has told the public how much money YouTube makes from ads. Before now, YouTube's ad money had just been included in Google's total. Alphabet did not say what YouTube's 2019 profits were, and it did not say how much it paid to YouTubers. However, in a call to investors, Alphabet's Ruth Porat said that the company paid YouTubers out of its content acquisition costs, which were around $8.5 billion. Most people make money on YouTube by joining its partner program. They can ask to join when they have at least 1,000 subscribers and people have watched a total of 4,000 hours of their videos in 12 months. If they are accepted, they make money by having ads on their videos. The Verge reports that in the past, YouTubers have not known how much money the company made from the ads on their videos. Some have already been unhappy with how much money their channels get. Now that they know how much money YouTube gets from ads, they may want more. Popular YouTube stars can get millions of dollars a year. The highest paid YouTube star, eight-year-old Ryan Gaji, made $26 million in 2019. However, top stars don't just get money from ads, but also from sponsorships and tours, and by selling products. Dublin Company makes world's first meat patch. Strong Roots, a company from Dublin that makes frozen vegan food has made the world's first meat patch, 
When scratched, the patch smells like cooked bacon, which is supposed to help vegans and vegetarians stop wanting to eat it. Oxford professor Charles Spence, an expert in how the brain understands taste and smell, worked with strong roots to develop the patch. He told the Telegraph that smelling bacon can allow you to imagine eating it. And if you imagine eating enough bacon, you won't want to eat real bacon anymore. But Graham Innes of St. Albans told the Telegraph, if I can smell bacon, I'll want to eat bacon. It's very simple. I'm not going to be satisfied with a cheese sandwich with when I can smell bacon coming from the patch. According to the Telegraph, a survey of 2,000 Britons found that 36% felt guilty when eating meat and 43% wanted to eat it less. However, 18% said it would be difficult to stop eating it, while only 15% said it would be difficult to quit smoking or drinking alcohol. The survey also found that Britons would miss bacon most, with 20% saying it was their favorite meat. Strong Roots Bacon Patches are now being tested among people who are trying to stop eating meat in several cities in the UK. They are also being supported by Tommy Fury, who was on the popular TV show Love Island. Strong Roots was founded in 2015 and its products can now be found in all major grocery stores in the UK. It began selling vegan products in the US in 2019. Dublin Company makes world's first meat patch. Strong Roots, a company from Dublin that makes frozen vegan food, has made the world's first meat patch. When scratched, the patch smells like cooked bacon, which is supposed to help vegans and vegetarians stop wanting to eat it. Oxford professor Charles Spence, an expert in how the brain understands taste and smell, worked with strong roots to develop the patch. He told the Telegraph that smelling bacon can allow you to imagine eating it, and if you imagine eating enough bacon, you won't want to eat real bacon anymore.
But Graham Innes of St. Albans told the Telegraph, If I can smell bacon, I'll want to eat bacon. It's very simple. I'm not going to be satisfied with the cheese sandwich when I can smell bacon coming from the patch. According to the Telegraph, a survey of 2,000 Britons found that 36% felt guilty when eating meat and 43% wanted to eat it less. However, 18% said it would be difficult to stop eating it, while only 15% said it would be difficult to quit smoking or drinking alcohol. The survey also found that Britons would miss bacon most, with 20% saying it was their favorite meat. Strong roots bacon patches are now being tested among people who are trying to stop eating meat in several cities in the UK. They are also being supported by Tommy Fury, who was on the popular TV show Love Island. Strong Roots was founded in 2015, and its products can now be found in all major grocery stores in the UK. It began selling vegan products in the US in 2019. Only 40% of people in Africa have internet access. While many of us are able to get online 24 hours a day, fewer than half of the people living in Africa have access to the internet. Africa is the second largest continent in the world with 54 countries that are home to around 1.3 billion people. And while countries in Africa have different sized economies and populations. The average number of people on the continent with internet access is only 40%. Some countries like South Africa have higher numbers of internet users. In 2018, 63.8% of South African citizens were able to use the internet. In Nigeria, 47.1% of the population had internet access in 2018. And most of those were using their mobile phones. As of June 2019, 74% of people online in Nigeria used their phones to access the internet, while only 24% were using a computer. One problem is the cost of internet access. According to the Alliance for Affordable Internet, which looked at 136 countries, Africans are paying an average of 7.12% of their income every month for only one gigabyte of data. In countries like Chad, Democratic Republic of the Congo, and Central African Republic, however, People are spending over 20% of their 
money for the same amount. If Americans paid 7.12% of their income for one gigabyte of data, that would be around $373 a month. That's a lot more than the average $60 a month most Americans are paying for as much data as they want. Only 40% of people in Africa have internet access. While many of us are able to get online 24 hours a day, fewer than half of the people living in Africa have access to the internet. Africa is the second largest continent in the world with 54 countries that are home to around 1.3 billion people. And while countries in Africa have different sized economies and populations, the average number of people on the continent with internet access is only 40%. Some countries like South Africa have higher numbers of internet users. In 2018, 63.8% of South African citizens were able to use the internet. In Nigeria, 47.1% of the population had internet access in 2018, and most of those were using their mobile phones. As of June 2019, 74% of people online in Nigeria use their phones to access the internet, while only 24% were using a computer. One problem is the cost of internet access. According to the Alliance for Affordable Internet, which looked at 136 countries, Africans are paying an average of 7.12% of their income every month for only one gigabyte of data. In countries like Chad, Democratic Republic of the Congo and the Central African Republic. However, people are spending over 20% of their money for the same amount. If Americans paid 7.12% of their income for one gigabyte of data, that would be around $373 a month. That's a lot more than the average $60 a month most Americans are paying for as much data as they want. Singapore allows doctor visits by app. People in Singapore have been using smartphone apps for simple checkups with their doctors using text messages and video calls. And now the country's Healthcare Services Act approved in January will regulate these new telemedicine businesses, allowing the Ministry of Health to give licenses for new services. Marion O of Denton's Brodick, Singapore, a law firm said that the new law is significant because it focuses on the types of medical services provided, not where they're provided. For example, if a patient only needs to refill a prescription, it is less important that they go to a hospital and more important that they get advice from a doctor, even if it is over Skype. O said that these popular telemedicine services are ready to 
become a key feature of Singapore's health care system. However, new technology also comes with risks. It may be more difficult for a doctor to make the right decision over a video call. And there are questions about insurance and liability if something goes wrong. There are also concerns about how well these new apps will be able to protect personal medical information. My understanding is that out of 10 startups, maybe one survives. Desmond Y, a doctor, told the Business Times, when the rest close down, who will be keeping the patient records? Singapore is a world leader in biomedical science. It makes four out of the world's top 10 drugs. According to a report from TMF Group and Singapore's Economic Development Board, the report also notes that over 30 of the world's major biomedical science and drug companies have clinical trial centers in Singapore. Singapore allows doctor visits by app. People in Singapore have been using smartphone apps for simple checkups with their doctors using text messages and video calls. And now the country's Healthcare Services Act, approved in January, will regulate these new telemedicine businesses, allowing the Ministry of Health to give licenses for new services. Marion Ho of Denton's Radix Singapore, a law firm, said that the new law is significant because it focuses on the types of medical services provided, not where they're provided. For example, if a patient only needs to refill a prescription, it is less important that they go to a hospital and more important that they get advice from a doctor, even if it is over Skype. Ho said that these popular telemedicine services are ready to become a key feature of Singapore's healthcare system. However, new technology also comes with risks. It may be more difficult for a doctor to make the right decision over a video call, and there are questions about insurance and liability if something goes wrong. There are also concerns about how well these new apps will be able to protect personal medical information. My understanding is that out of 10 startups, maybe one survives. Desmond Y, a doctor, told the Business Times. When the rest close down, who will be keeping the patient records? Singapore is a world leader in biomedical science. It makes four out of the world's top 10 drugs, according to a report from TMF Group and Singapore's Economic Development Board. The report also notes that over 30 of the world's major biomedical science and drug companies have clinical trial centers in Singapore. Eating natto and miso may reduce risk of death. 
researchers in Japan have found that eating fermented soybean products like miso or natto may reduce your risk of early death. They also found that eating other soybean products like tofu did not have any effect on a person's risk of death. Natto is made by adding bacteria to boiled soybeans, which causes the beans to ferment. The result is very sticky and has a strong smell. Often eaten with rice and fish at breakfast. Many Japanese people believe natto is good for their health. Miso is usually made by mixing boiled soybeans with rice, salt, and a kind of mold called koji, which allows the mixture to ferment. Miso paste is often used for soup, sauces, and salad dressing. The researchers studied the diets of more than 90,000 people between the ages of 45 and 74 for about 15 years. During that time, around 13,000 died. The researchers found that the people who ate the most fermented soybean products were 10% less likely to die than those who ate the least. They also found that the people who ate the most natto but not miso were 18% less likely to die of heart disease. This may be because natto has less sodium, which increases the risk of heart disease. The authors also noted that fermented soybean products are made from whole soybeans, so they are made with all the healthy parts of the bean, unlike other products that lose some of them. And while other studies have found that eating soy products can reduce the risk of some kinds of cancer, the researchers found no effect on cancer from eating non-fermented soybean products. A 2017 study found that people who ate more fermented soybean products were less likely to have high blood pressure after five years, but 
also found no effect from other soybean products. Eating natto and miso may reduce risk of death. Researchers in Japan have found that eating fermented soybean products like miso or natto may reduce your risk of early death. They also found that eating other soybean products like tofu did not have any effect on a person's risk of death. Natto is made by adding bacteria to boiled soybeans which causes the beans to ferment. The result is very sticky and has a strong smell. Often eaten with rice and fish at breakfast, many Japanese people believe natto is good for their health. Miso is usually made by mixing boiled soybeans with rice, salt, and a kind of mold called koji, which allows the mixture to ferment. Miso paste is often used for soup, sauces, and salad dressing. The researchers studied the diets of more than 90,000 people between the ages of 45 and 74 for about 15 years. During that time, around 13,000 died. The researchers found that the people who ate the most fermented soybean products were 10% less likely to die than those who ate the least. They also found that the people who ate the most natto, but not miso, were 18% less likely to die of heart disease. This may be because natto has less sodium, which, is, which increases the risk of heart disease. The authors also noted that fermented soybean products are made from whole soybeans. So they are made with all the healthy parts of the bean unlike other products that lose some of them. And while other studies have found that eating soy products can reduce the risk of some kinds of cancer, the researchers found no effect on cancer from eating non-fermented soybean products. A 2017 study found that people who ate more fermented soybean products were less likely to have high blood pressure after five years but also found no effect from other soybean products. Record high temperatures seen in Antarctica. Researchers from Argentina at a base in the Antarctic say they have recorded the hottest temperature there since readings began more than 60 years ago. The World Meteorological Organization, WMO, said Argentina's Esperanza base recorded a high of 18.3 degrees Celsius on Thursday, February 6. The agency said that this breaks the old record of 17.5 degrees Celsius in March 2015. A WMO official, Randall Cerveni, said the agency still needs to check and confirm that the recording taken at the base was correct, but says that it probably was. Researchers at Esperanza Base, which is in the north of Antarctica near South America, have been recording temperatures there since 1961. The WMO says the Antarctic Peninsula is among the fastest warming parts of the world, with temperatures rising almost 3 degrees Celsius over the past 50 years. 
Scientists think that global warming is increasing as quickly as the ice sheets around Antarctica are melting, which is causing sea levels to rise. The temperature at Argentina's Morambio base, also in Antarctica, broke records too, with readings as high as 14.1 degrees Celsius on the same day. This means the area has had its hottest February temperature since 1971. Record high temperatures seen in Antarctica. Researchers from Argentina at a base in the Antarctic say that they have recorded the hottest temperature there since readings began more than 60 years ago. The World Meteorological Organization, WMO, said Argentina's Esperanza base recorded a high of 18.3 degrees Celsius on Thursday, February 6th. The agency said that this breaks the old record of 17.5 degrees Celsius in March 2015. A WMO official, Randall Cerveni, said the agency still needs to check and confirm that the recording taken at the base was correct, but says that it probably was. Researchers at Esperanza Base, which is in the north of Antarctica near South America, have been recording temperatures there since 1961. The WMO says the Antarctic Peninsula is among the fastest warming parts of the world, with temperatures rising almost 3 degrees Celsius over the past 50 years. Scientists think that global warming is increasing as quickly as the ice sheets around Antarctica are melting, which is causing sea levels to rise. The temperature at Argentina's Morambio base, also in Antarctica, broke records too with readings as high as 14.1 degrees Celsius on the same day. This means the area has had its hottest February temperature since 1971. Samsung unveils another foldable phone on February 11th, Samsung unveiled a new foldable phone. The Galaxy Z Flip, its second attempt at a phone with a bendable screen. The new phone can unfold from a small square upward into a traditional smartphone shape. The company announced the phone at a product event in San Francisco. It went on sale February 14th starting at $1,380. Samsung's first foldable phone, the Galaxy Fold, finally went on sale in September 2019 after delays and reports of screens breaking. The Fold, which costs nearly $2,000, folds vertically rather than horizontally, like the Z Flip. The foldable phones represent an attempt to energize a market where sales have slowed. 
Many consumers are holding on to old phones longer, in part because new phone features offer increasingly marginal benefits. While these innovative new designs are nice to have, they're not must-have. Sought-after features among users, said Paolo Pescatori, an analyst at PP Foresight. The Z Flip can stay open at different angles for watching videos or taking photos. When the phone is closed, it will take selfies and display notifications in a small window on the cover. Samsung also showed off the more traditional Galaxy S20, S20 Plus, and S20 Ultra. The phones can take both video and photos at the same time using artificial intelligence to find the best moments to take still images. Other smartphone makers are also focusing on their cameras. Apple last fall announced the iPhone 11, which offers an additional lens for wider angle shots and improved low light images. Google's Pixel phones also offer a low light feature. Samsung's S phones already offer the wider angle and some features for low lighting as well. The S20 phones go on sale in the U.S. on March 6th and will range in price from $1,000 to $1,400. All S20 models will be compatible with next generation cellular networks known as 5G. Although it's still an early technology that consumers typically won't need yet, the Z Flip will not work with 5G networks. Samsung unveils another foldable phone. On February 11th, Samsung unveiled a new foldable phone, the Galaxy Z Flip, its second attempt at a phone with a bendable screen. The new phone can unfold from a small square upward into a traditional smartphone shape. The company announced the phone at a product event in San Francisco. It went on sale February 14th, starting at $1,380. Samsung's first foldable phone, the Galaxy Fold, finally went on sale in September 2019 after delays and reports of screens breaking. The Fold, which 
costs nearly $2,000, folds vertically rather than horizontally like the Z Flip. The foldable phones represent an attempt to energize a market where sales have slowed. Many consumers are holding on to old phones longer, in part because new phone features offer increasingly marginal benefits. While these innovative new designs are nice to have, they're not must-have, sought-after features among users, said Paolo Pescatori, an analyst at PP Foresight. The Z Flip can stay open at different angles for watching videos or taking photos. When the phone is closed, it will take selfies and display notifications in a small window on the cover. Samsung also showed off the more traditional Galaxy S20, S20 Plus, and S20 Ultra. The phones can take both video and photos at the same time, using artificial intelligence to find the best moments to take still images. Other smartphone makers are also focusing on their cameras. Apple last fall announced the iPhone 11, which offers an additional lens for wider angle shots and improved low light images. Google's Pixel phones also offer a low light feature. Samsung's S phones already offer the wider angle and some features for low lighting as well. The S20 phones go on sale in the US on March 6th and will range in price from $1,000 to $1,400. Also, S20 models will be compatible with next-generation cellular networks known as 5G, although it's still an early technology that consumers typically won't need yet. The Z Flip will not work with 5G networks. Award encourages new designs for inside airplanes. The Crystal Cabin Award encourages companies to develop new products and designs for airplane cabins. Begun in 2007, 150 ideas from 21 different countries are on this year's shortlist, with many focusing on ways to make flying easier and more comfortable for travelers. Aircraft Innovations GmbH has designed a seat that can be placed within a regular seat and inflated to make it easy for babies and young children to sit or sleep. It weighs one kilogram and can be inflated in less than one minute. Adent Aerospace has designed a seat extension that folds out from the wall in front of the first row of seats, making the row into a small bed that a family could share. Hamburg's Heinkel Group has a design for seats that can be turned around after the plane takes off, so passengers traveling together can face one another. Collins Aerospace also has a seat for flight attendants that can stretch out so that they can almost lie down on brakes. 
students at the University of Cincinnati have suggested taking out the middle row of seats in business class and replacing them with seats placed sideways along a long table with space for computers, like in an airport cafe or fast food restaurant. Irish designer Ciara Crawford has also designed a wheelchair that can fit over the airplane seat, allowing people to use the same wheelchair from check-in to arrival. The design already won a European Product Design Award in 2019. Winners of the Crystal Cabin Award will be announced at the Aircraft Interiors Expo in Hamburg, Germany in March 2020. Award encourages new designs for inside airplanes. The Crystal Cabin Award encourages companies to develop new products and designs for airplane cabins. Begun in 2007, 105 ideas from 21 different countries are on this year's shortlist, with many focusing on ways to make flying easier and more comfortable for travelers. Aircraft Innovations GmbH has designed a seat that can be placed within a regular seat and inflated to make it easier for babies and young children to sit or sleep. It weighs one kilogram and can be inflated in less than one minute. Adden Aerospace has designed a seat extension that folds out from the wall in front of the first row of seats making the row into a small bed that a family could share. Hamburg's Heinkel Group has a design for seats that can be turned around after the plane takes off, so passengers traveling together can face one another. Collins Aerospace also has a seat for flight attendants that can stretch out so that they can almost lie down on brakes. Students at the University of Cincinnati have suggested taking out the middle row of seats in business class and replacing them with seats placed sideways along a long table with space for computers, like in an airport cafe or fast food restaurant. Irish designer Ciara Crawford has also designed a wheelchair that can fit over the airplane seat allowing people to use the same wheelchair from check-in to arrival. The design already won a European Product Design Award in 2019. Winners of the Crystal Cabin Award will be announced at the Aircraft Interiors Expo in Hamburg, Germany in March 2020. New evidence of unknown human ancestors found. New evidence has been found to suggest that some modern humans have DNA from a previously unknown population of ancient humans that lived in Africa about 500,000 years ago. Today, there is only one species of human, but in the past,
past, there were several human subspecies, such as the Neanderthal in Europe and the Denisovans in Eurasia. Individuals from those groups sometimes had children with the ancestors of modern humans, which is why their DNA can sometimes be found in people living today. Scientists from the University of California recently looked at the DNA of people from four West African populations and found that between 2% and 19% of it comes from a human subspecies other than the Neanderthals or Denisovans. This previously unknown subspecies is believed to have separated from a shared ancestor of Neanderthals and modern humans sometime between 360,000 and 1 million years ago. John Hawks from the University of Wisconsin Madison told the Guardian that it will not be possible to confirm anything about this subspecies until actual remains are found. It's an exciting moment because these studies open a window showing us that there is much more to learn about our ancestors, Hawks said. But actually, knowing who those ancestors were, how they interacted, and where they existed is going to take field work to find their remains. The University of California researchers now want to find out what the ancient genes are for. It's possible they are still part of West African DNA because they helped those people survive and have children. New Evidence of Unknown Human Ancestors Found New evidence has been found to suggest that some modern humans have DNA from a previously unknown population of ancient humans that lived in Africa about 500,000 years ago. Today, there is only one species of human, but in the past, there were several human subspecies, such as the Neanderthals in Europe and the Denisovians in Eurasia. Individuals from those groups sometimes had children with the ancestors of modern humans, which is why their DNA can sometimes be found in people living today. Scientists from the University of California recently looked at the DNA of people from four West African populations and found that between 2% and 19% of it comes from a human subspecies other than the Neanderthals or 
in a solvent. This previously unknown subspecies is believed to have separated from a shared ancestor of Neanderthals and modern humans sometime between 360,000 and 1 million years ago. John Hawkes from the University of Wisconsin-Madison told The Guardian that it will not be possible to confirm anything about this subspecies until actual remains are found. It's an exciting moment because these studies open a window showing us that there is much more to learn about our ancestors, Hawks said. But actually knowing who those ancestors were, how they interacted, and where they existed is going to take field work to find their remains. The University of California researchers now want to find out what the ancient genes are for. It's possible they are still part of West African DNA because they helped those people survive and have children. Artist uses 99 phones to create fake traffic jam. A German artist made Google Maps believe there were traffic jams in Berlin by using a cart to slowly pull 99 phones through the streets. Simon Becker rented phones and borrowed from friends to get 99. The phones thought they were in slow traffic, so Google Maps sent alerts for the streets he was walking on, even though many were really empty. He also walked past Google's office in Berlin. Wecke posted a short video about his hack to YouTube on February 1st, showing streets on Google Maps turning red as he slowly walked around the city with his red cart. It has already been watched more than three million times. On his website, Beckett said that Google Maps makes new kinds of businesses and technologies possible, like Uber and Tinder. And the Maps can change the way people behave. He wanted to show how fake data could have an impact on the real world because Google Maps would tell people to avoid the busy streets and make people think about how much they trust that the data they use has not been influenced by others. Becca is also worried about how humans and societies are interacting with technology. I have the feeling right now that technology is not adapting to us. It's the other way around, he told Wired. Google responded by saying, we love seeing creative uses of Google Maps as it helps us make maps work better over time. 
it said that while it has found a way to tell the difference between cars and motorcycles, it doesn't yet know how to stop a cart from creating another fake traffic jam. Google Maps was first released in the U.S. on February 8, 2005. It has now been in use for more than 15 years. Artist uses 99 phones to create fake traffic jam. A German artist made Google Maps believe there were traffic jams in Berlin by using a cart to slowly pull 99 phones through the streets. Simon Beckert rented phones and borrowed from friends to get 99. The phones thought they were in slow traffic, so Google Maps sent alerts for the streets he was walking on, even though many were really empty. He also walked past Google's office in Berlin. Beckert posted a short video about his hack to YouTube on February 1st, showing streets on Google Maps turning red as he slowly walked around the city with his red cart. It has already been watched more than 3 million times. On his website, Beckett said that Google Maps makes new kinds of businesses and technologies possible, like Uber and Tinder, and the maps can change the way people behave. He wanted to show how fake data could have an impact on the real world because Google Maps would tell people to avoid the busy streets and make people think about how much they trust that the data they use has not been influenced by others. Becker is also worried about how humans and societies are interacting with technology. I have the feeling right now that technology is not adapting to us. It's the other way around, he told Wired. Google responded by saying, We love seeing creative uses of Google Maps as it helps us make maps work better over time. It said that while it has found a way to tell the difference between cars and motorcycles, it doesn't yet know how to stop a cart from creating another fake traffic jam. Google Maps was first released in the U.S. on February 8, 2005. It has now been in use for more than 15 years. Eating saturated fat may make concentrating difficult. Just one meal high in saturated fat can reduce a person's ability to concentrate. According to a study published in the American Journal, of clinical nutrition. The study compared how 51 women performed on a continuous performance test, CPT, one hour before and five hours after eating one of two meals. CPTs measure how long a person can stay focused on a task. The women were also given blood tests for endotoxemia, a condition where bacteria leaks from the gut into the blood. One group of women ate a meal that was high in saturated fat, and the other ate one that was 
low in saturated fat, but high in unsaturated fat. After between one and four weeks had passed, the women took the tests again, except they ate the other meal. The study found that the women who ate the meal higher in saturated fat got worse scores on the CPT, meaning they found it difficult to focus and became distracted more easily. On average, the women were 11% less able to pay attention after eating the high saturated fat meal. Women with endotoxemia also found it difficult to stay focused, even if they had eaten the meal with little saturated fat. They had more erratic response times and were less able to stay focused during the 10-minute CPT test. Lead author Annalise Madison, a graduate student at the Ohio State University, said that most previous studies had looked at the effects of diet over a longer period of time, but her study found that just one meal could hinder a person's ability to concentrate. It's pretty remarkable that we saw a difference, she told Ohio State News. Madison also said that because both meals in her study were high in fat, the effect of the high saturated fat meal could be even greater if compared to a lower fat meal. Eating saturated fat may make concentrating difficult. Just one meal high in saturated fat can reduce a person's ability to concentrate, according to a study published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. The study compared how 51 women performed on a continuous performance test, CPT one hour before and five hours after eating one of two meals. CPTs measure how long a person can stay focused on a task. The women were also given blood tests for endotoxemia, a condition where bacteria leaks from the gut into the blood. One group of women ate a meal that was high in saturated fat, and the other ate one that was low in saturated fat but high in unsaturated fat. After between one and four weeks had passed, the women took the tests again, except they ate the other meal. The study found that the women who ate the meal higher in saturated fat got worse scores on the CPT, meaning they found it difficult to focus and became distracted more easily. On average, 
the women were 11% less able to pay attention after eating the high saturated fat meal. Women with endotoxemia also found it difficult to stay focused, even if they had eaten the meal with little saturated fat. They had more erratic response times and were less able to stay focused during the 10-minute CPT test. Lead author Annalise Madison, a graduate student at the Ohio State University, said that most previous studies had looked at the effects of a diet over a longer period of time, but her study found that just one meal could hinder a person's ability to concentrate. It's pretty remarkable that we saw a difference, she told Ohio State News. Madison also said that because both meals in her study were high in fat, the effect of the high saturated fat meal could be even greater if compared to a lower fat meal. Study. Most employees go to work while sick. A new study by the Australian National University has found that nearly all employees would continue to go to work when experiencing flu-like symptoms. The study published in the journal PLOS1 asked over 500 workers from 49 countries about going to work while sick. Nearly half of those that took part were employed in healthcare. Almost all employees, 99.2% of healthcare workers and 96.5% of non-healthcare workers said that they would continue to work with minor symptoms such as coughing, sneezing, and having a runny nose. More than 50% of healthcare workers said that they had gone to work with more severe symptoms, including fever, cold chills, and headaches. According to study authors, this might be because healthcare workers feel a sense of obligation to their colleagues or organization to go to work even when they are not feeling well. Doctors and nurses might feel they need to go out of their way to help others, but it is best for everyone if they do not go to work if unwell. One of the study authors, Peter Kolonon said, although the study was carried out before the COVID-19 pandemic, the researchers note that their findings are now especially important. It was bad before COVID-19, and now we are in a pandemic. Going to work sick is just unacceptable, Kalinan said. A different study published in October 2019 by U.S. company Robert Half found that 90% of Americans go to work while feeling under the weather. Study. 
Most employees go to work while sick. A new study by the Australian National University has found that nearly all employees would continue to go to work when experiencing flu-like symptoms. The study, published in the journal PLOS1, asked over 500 workers from 49 countries about going to work while sick. Nearly half of those that took part were employed in healthcare. Almost all employees, 99.2% of healthcare workers and 96.5% of non-healthcare workers, said that they would continue to work with minor symptoms, such as coughing, sneezing, and having a runny nose. More than 50% of healthcare workers said that they had gone to work with more severe symptoms, including fever, cold chills, and headaches. According to study authors, this might be because healthcare workers feel a sense of obligation to their colleagues or organization to go to work even when they are not feeling well. Doctors and nurses might feel they need to go out of their way to help others, but it is best for everyone if they do not go to work if unwell, one of the study authors, Peter Collignon, said. Although the study was carried out before the COVID-19 pandemic, the researchers note that their findings are now especially important. It was bad before COVID-19, and now we are in a pandemic. Going to work sick is just unacceptable, Collignon said. A different study published in October 2019 by the U.S. company Robert Half found that 90% of Americans go to work while feeling under the weather. Elon Musk and Grimes name first child XAI A12. Billionaire Elon Musk and Canadian singer Grimes have revealed the name of their first child and it has left many people confused. On May 4th, Musk went on Twitter to share news of the birth of their son, XAI A12 Musk. But many people aren't sure how to say the name. On a podcast, Musk said the first part is pronounced X-ash, with X read like the letter. However, Grimes, whose real name is Claire Boucher, told fans on Instagram that the first part of the name is pronounced just like reading the letters X A I. Both Grimes and Musk have explained that A12 was the name of a plane used by the CIA in the 1960s, where the A was for Archangel. Whatever way you say it, it's possible that XAI-812 isn't an acceptable name in California, where the couple lives. David Glass, a family law expert, told People in California, you can only use the 26 characters of the English language in your baby name. The two aren't the first celebrity couple to give their child an unusual name. When they were still together, Academy Award winner Gwyneth Paltrow and Coldplay singer Chris
Chris Martin named their first child Apple. Their friends, power couple Beyonce and Jay-Z, named their children Blue Ivy, Rumi, and Sir. Kanye West and his wife, reality TV star Kim Kardashian, also gave interesting names to their four children, North, Saint, Chicago, and Psalm. Elon Musk and Grimes named first child X AI A12. Billionaire Elon Musk and Canadian singer Grimes have revealed the name of their first child, and it has left many people confused. On May 4th, Musk went on Twitter to share news of the birth of their son, X AI A12 Musk. But many people aren't sure how to say the name. On a podcast, Musk said that the first part is pronounced X-Ash, with X read like the letter. However, Grimes, whose real name is Claire Buncher, told fans on Instagram that the first part of the name is pronounced just like reading the letters X-A-I. Both Grimes and Musk have explained that A-12 was the name of a plane used by the CIA in the 1960s, where the A was for Archangel. Whatever way you say it, it's possible that XAI-812 isn't an acceptable name in California, where the couple lives. David Glass, a family law expert, told People, in California, you can only use the 26 characters of the English language in your baby name. The two aren't the first celebrity couple to give their child an unusual name. When they were still together, Academy Award winner Gwyneth Paltrow and Coldplay singer Chris Martin named their first child Apple. Their friends, power couple Beyonce and Jay-Z, named their children Blue Ivy Rumi and Sir. Kanye West and his wife, reality TV star Kim Kardashian, also gave interesting names to their four children, North, Saint, Chicago, and Psalm. NASA wants candidates for isolation study. NASA is looking for candidates to go into isolation for eight months in an experiment to help prepare for long stays on the moon and Mars. Researchers say the study will help them better understand how being in space for long periods affects people physically and mentally. To date, all long-term stays in space have taken place on the International Space Station, ISS. Most of these missions lasted several months, with the longest continuing for nearly a year. The new experiment is focused on NASA's future goals, which include traveling further into space and for longer periods. It will build on a four-month study that ended in 
July 2019. NASA is working with the Institute of Biomedical Problems of Russia's Academy of Sciences for the study. The experiment will take place at a research center in Moscow. Candidates for the study must be between 30 and 55 years old and speak both English and Russian. They must be highly educated, though military officers or people with a bachelor's degree with relevant experience may also be considered. They must also pass medical and psychological tests. Those chosen for the study will be put in an environment similar to what astronauts are expected to experience on future missions to Mars, NASA said. The group will carry out scientific research during their stay with some of the experiments involving virtual reality and robotics to prepare for future missions to the moon and Mars. NASA plans to return humans to the moon by 2024 and to build a base there by 2028. Astronauts could live there to do experiments and possibly launch missions from the base to Mars. NASA wants candidates for isolation study. NASA is looking for candidates to go into isolation for eight months in an experiment to help prepare for long stays on the moon and Mars. Researchers say the study will help them better understand how being in space for long periods affects people physically and mentally. To date, all long-term stays in space have taken place on the International Space Station, ISS. Most of these missions lasted several months, with the longest continuing for nearly a year. The new experiment is focused on NASA's future goals, which include traveling further into space and for longer periods. It will build on a four-month study that ended in July 2019. NASA is working with the Institute of Biomedical Problems of Russia's Academy of Sciences for the study. The experiment will take place at a research center in Moscow. Candidates for the study must be between 30 and 55 years old and speak both English and Russian. They must be highly educated though military officers or people with a bachelor's degree with relevant experience may also be considered. They must also pass medical and psychological tests. Those chosen for the study will be put in an environment similar to what astronauts are expected to experience on future missions to Mars, NASA said. The group will carry out scientific research during their stay with some of the experiments involving virtual reality and robotics to prepare for future missions to the Moon and Mars. NASA plans to return humans to the Moon by 2024 
and to build a base there by 2028. Astronauts could live there to do experiments and possibly launch missions from the base to Mars. New app sends fans cheers from home. Japanese company Yamaha Corporation is releasing an app that lets fans cheer from home called Remote Cheerer powered by Sound UD. It lets people send their support to live events with their smartphone. The app has been designed for anyone who can't go to an event because they are looking after children in hospital, live far away, or just prefer to watch from home. So it's perfect for those wanting to show support for their favorite teams playing in empty stadiums. The coronavirus canceled sports events around the world as rules against travel and large crowds made it difficult for them to continue. But some countries are now starting to bring sports back, although most are doing so without fans in attendance. Remote Cheerer lets users press different buttons to send sounds like cheering, booing, or clapping to a venue's speakers. Speakers can also be put on audience seats to make it sound more like fans are really there and can even be grouped so that it seems like each team's supporters are sitting together. On May 13th, Yamaha tested the app at Shizuoka Stadium, Hikopa, one of Japan's largest soccer stadiums, with the help of two Japanese soccer teams. Keisuke Matsubayashi, who works for the stadium company, said that during the test, he closed his eyes and it felt like the cheering fans were right there in the stadium with me. Yamaha said it plans to improve the app so it can be used for different kinds of events like concerts. It may even let users use their real voices. New app sends fans cheers from home. Japanese company Yamaha Corporation is releasing an app that lets fans cheer from home. Called Remote Cheerer, powered by Sound UD, it lets people send their support to live events with their smartphone. The app has been designed for anyone who can't go to an event because they are looking after children, in hospital, live far away, or just prefer to watch from home. So it's perfect for those wanting to show support for their favorite teams playing in an empty stadium. 
the coronavirus canceled sports events around the world as rules against travel and large crowds made it difficult for them to continue. But some countries are now starting to bring sports back, although most are doing so without fans in attendance. Remote Cheer lets users press different buttons to send sounds like cheering, booing, or clapping to a venue's speakers. Speakers can also be put on audience seats to make it sound more like fans are really there and can even be grouped so that it seems like each team's supporters are sitting together. On May 13th, Yamaha tested the app at Shizuoka Stadium Ikopa, one of Japan's largest soccer stadiums, with the help of two Japanese soccer teams. Kaisuke Matsubayashi, who works for the stadium company, said that during the test he closed his eyes and it felt like the cheering fans were right there in the stadium with him. Yamaha said it plans to improve the app so it can be used for different kinds of events, like concerts. It may even let users use their real voices. Garbage Cafe trades plastic for food in India. With garbage, especially single-use plastic, becoming a problem for many Indian cities. One cafe is trading trash for meals called Garbage Cafe. It can be found at the main bus station of Ambikapur, a city in eastern India. Mayor Ajay Tirki is proud of how quickly the cafe became popular after it opened in October 2019. We're getting about a dozen people coming in every day, Tirki told the Guardian. One day, a whole family came in with huge stacks weighing seven kilos. The cafe trades trash for a warm meal. Anyone can bring their garbage to recycle and a full meal costs one kilogram of plastic per person or half a kilogram for breakfast. The waste from Garbage Cafe is then used to create new roads. In 2015, Ambikapur used 800,000 plastic bags to make a road. It has lasted really well, even during the monsoon rains, said Mayor Tirki. Ram Yadav is one of thousands of people in India who get money by collecting garbage. He used to go hungry some nights, wishing he could eat in a restaurant. Now, he gets his food by bringing plastic to the cafe. The hot meal I get here lasts me all day, Yadav told the Guardian. And it feels good to sit at a table like everyone else. For him, the cafe is a dream come true. The city also hopes to build homeless shelters that will trade trash for a place to sleep.
Garbage Cafe trades plastic for food in India. With garbage, especially single-use plastic, becoming a problem for many Indian cities, one cafe is trading trash for meals. Called Garbage Cafe, it can be found at the main bus station of Ambriyapur, a city in eastern India. Mayor Ajay Tirthi is proud of how quickly the cafe became popular after it opened in October 2019. We're getting about a dozen people coming in every day, Tirthi told The Guardian. One day, a whole family came in with huge stacks weighing seven kilos. The cafe trades trash for a warm meal. Anyone can bring their garbage to recycle and a full meal costs one kilogram of plastic per person, or half a kilogram for breakfast. The waste from Garbage Cafe is then used to create new roads. In 2015, Ambikapur used 800,000 plastic bags to make a road. It has lasted really well, even during the monsoon rains, said Mayor Tirthi. Ram Yadav is one of thousands of people in India who get money by collecting garbage. He used to go hungry some nights, wishing he could eat in a restaurant. Now, he gets his food by bringing plastic to the cafe. The hot meal I get here lasts me all day, Yadav told The Guardian, and it feels good to sit at a table like everyone else. For him, the cafe is a dream come true. The city also hopes to build homeless shelters that will trade trash for a place to sleep. World's largest electric plane takes flight. The world's largest all electric passenger plane has successfully completed a 30-minute test flight. The e-caravan, which took off from an airport in Moses Lake, Washington, on May 28th, performed flawlessly. According to test pilot Steve Crane, the plane can carry nine passengers, but Crane was the only person on board during the test flight. Powered by a 750 horsepower electric engine, The craft flew at the speed of 183 kilometers per hour and climbed to a height of 760 meters. Magna X, the company that developed the plane's electric engine hopes that the aircraft will be ready for commercial use by the end of 2021. Without traditional fuel-powered engines, electric airplanes could be better for the environment, less noisy and cheaper to run. Rui Ganzarski, CEO of Magna X, says that electric airplanes will be 40% to 70% less expensive to operate per flight hour.
Genzarski believes that all flights of less than 1,600 kilometers will be completely electric within the next 15 years. But battery technology needs to improve for that to happen. At the moment, the e-caravan can only travel about 160 kilometers. Magna X, however, is not alone in its quest to create battery powered planes. Companies like Airbus, Embraer, and Rolls Royce are also working on developing electric aircraft as well as NASA, which is currently testing its first all electric plane. World's largest electric plane takes flight. The world's largest all-electric passenger plane has successfully completed a 30-minute test flight. The e-caravan, which took off from an airport in Moses Lake, Washington, on May 28th, performed flawlessly, according to test pilot Steve Crane. The plane can carry nine passengers, but Crane was the only person on board during the test flight. Powered by a 750 horsepower electric engine, the aircraft flew at the speed of 183 kilometers per hour and climbed to a height of 760 meters. Magna X, the company that developed the plane's electric engine, hopes that the aircraft will be ready for commercial use by the end of 2021. Without traditional fuel-powered engines, electric airplanes could be better for the environment, less noisy, and cheaper to run. Rui Genzarski, CEO of MagnaX, says that electric airplanes will be 40% to 70% less expensive to operate per flight hour. Ganzarski believes that all flights of less than 1,600 kilometers will be completely electric within the next 15 years. But battery technology needs to improve for that to happen. At the moment, the e-caravan can only travel about 160 kilometers. Magna X, however, is not alone in its quest to create battery-powered planes. Companies like Airbus, Embraer and Rolls-Royce are also working on developing electric aircraft, as well as NASA, which is currently testing its first all-electric plane. Tokyo is third most expensive city for expats. Tokyo is the third most expensive city for expatriates or expats. According to Mercer's 2020 cost of living survey, that's one spot lower than in 2019 when Tokyo was in second place. Hong Kong is the most expensive city for expats, while Ashgabat in Turkmenistan is now the second most expensive. Six of the top 10 cities this year 
are in Asia. Mercer figures out the cost of living for expats to help employers know what they should pay staff who are working in other countries to find the cost of living mercer looks at the price of more than 200 goods and services in over 200 cities mercer includes things like housing, food, utilities, transportation, entertainment, and clothing. Each city is then compared with New York City to find its rank. The city of Tunis, Tunisia, is the least expensive city for expats in 2020. The second least expensive is Windhoek, Namibia, and third least expensive is Tashkent, Uzbekistan. Because the survey was done during the coronavirus pandemic, Mercer also found that people were buying some products more than usual, like cleaning products, entertainment products, and comfort food. Food that's eaten because it tastes good and makes people feel better. Cleaning products such as soap and disinfectant were most expensive in New York City. Mexico City had the most expensive entertainment products like TVs, and board games. And Hong Kong had the most expensive comfort food, like chocolate and frozen pizzas. Tokyo is third most expensive city for expats. Tokyo is the third most expensive city for expatriates or expats, according to Mercer's 2020 cost of living survey. That's one spot lower than in 2019 when Tokyo was in second place. Hong Kong is the most expensive city for expats, while Ash Gabat in Turkmenistan is now the second most expensive. Six of the top 10 cities this year are in Asia. Mercer figures out the cost of living for expats to help employers know what they should pay staff who are working in other countries. To find the cost of living, Mercer looks at the price of more than 200 goods and services in over 200 cities. Mercer includes things like housing, food, utilities, transportation, entertainment, and clothing. Each city is then compared with New York City to find its rank. The city of Tunis, Tunisia, is the least expensive city for expats in 2020. The second least expensive is Windhoek, Namibia, and third least expensive is Tashkent, Uzbekistan. Because the survey was done during the coronavirus pandemic, 
Mercer also found that people were buying some products more than usual, like cleaning products, entertainment products, and comfort food. Food that's eaten because it tastes good and makes people feel better. Cleaning products, such as soap and disinfectant, were most expensive in New York City. Mexico City had the most expensive entertainment products, like TVs and board games. And Hong Kong had the most expensive comfort food, like chocolate and frozen pizzas. Middle-aged Americans more stressed today than in 1990s. A new study has found that Americans aged between 45 and 65 may be much more stressed today than people in that same age range were in the 1990s. A team of researchers led by Penn State University looked at data from 1,499 adults in 1995 and data from 782 adults in 2012. Both groups were interviewed every day for eight days and were asked about anything stressful they had experienced in the previous 24 hours. This included things like arguments with family and friends and problems at work. The study published in American Psychologist found that 2% of adults experienced more stress in the 2010s than the 1990s. However, among those aged 45 to 64, 19% experienced more stress in the 2010s. David M. Almeida of Penn State University said the researchers were very surprised that so many middle-aged Americans were more stressed. Middle-aged people were also 17% more likely to think that stress would affect their future plans. The same age group was also 27% more likely to believe that their finances would be affected by stress in the 2010s than people that age in the 1990s. Healthline.com reports that Almeida and his team had expected adults to be more stressed now than in the 1990s. But he said they thought it would be people in their 20s and 30s who would be most stressed. Alameda says the research shows that middle-aged Americans seem to have more pressure on them now. For example, they might be looking after young adult children while also taking care of older family members. And at work, they are 
more likely to be in management roles with responsibility for many people. Middle-aged Americans more stressed today than in 1990s. A new study has found that Americans aged between 45 and 65 may be much more stressed today than people in that same age range were in the 1990s. A team of researchers led by Penn State University looked at data from 1,499 adults in 1995 and data from 782 adults in 2012. Both groups were interviewed every day for eight days and were asked about anything stressful they had experienced in the previous 24 hours. This included things like arguments with family and friends and problems at work. The study, published in American Psychologist, found that 2% of adults experienced more stress in the 2010s than the 1990s. However, among those aged 45 to 64, 19% experienced more stress in the 2010s. David M. Almeida of Penn State University said the researchers were very surprised that so many middle-aged Americans were more stressed. Middle-aged people were also 17% more likely to think that stress would affect their future plans. The same age group was also 27% more likely to believe that their finances would be affected by stress in the 2010s than people that age in the 1990s. Healthline.com reports that Almeida and his team had expected adults to be more stressed now than in the 1990s but he said they thought it would be people in their 20s and 30s who would be more stressed. Almeida says the research shows that middle-aged Americans seem to have more pressure on them now. For example, they might be looking after young adult children while also taking care of older family members. And at work, they are more likely to be in management roles with responsibility for many people. Survey. Lockdowns lead to healthier eating. With coronavirus lockdowns forcing millions around the world to stay at home, many people have started eating healthier, according to a recent survey. Preliminary results from the Corona cooking survey showed that people were buying less sweet foods, salty snacks, and ready-made meals, and more fresh fruit and vegetables during COVID-19 lockdowns. Many also reported reduced stress and frustration about cooking, tried new recipes, and wasted less food. The findings are based on online responses given by 11,000 people in 11 countries. Australia, Belgium, Chile, Uganda, the Netherlands, France, Austria, Greece, Canada, Brazil, and Ireland. The study conducted by the University of Antwerp in Belgium is set to be expanded to 25 more countries with the final results expected by the end of June.
Charlotte Debacker, who led the study, pointed out that people often eat more salty, fatty, and sugary foods when they are stressed. But instead of buying them, this need was met during lockdowns with home baking. Researchers believe that the healthier food choices could be a result of careful planning as people try to reduce the amount of time they spend in supermarkets. If you make a shopping list, you plan your meals ahead and you are less likely to add unhealthy food, Debacker said. However, Debacker suggests that the healthy eating habits people have adopted during the pandemic are likely to continue when life goes back to normal because lockdowns in most countries lasted for more than six weeks. The amount of time it usually takes to form a new habit. Survey. Lockdowns lead to healthier eating. With coronavirus lockdowns forcing millions around the world to stay at home, many people have started eating healthier, according to a recent survey. Preliminary results from the Corona Cooking Survey showed that people were buying less sweet foods, salty snacks, and ready-made meals, and more fresh fruit and vegetables during COVID-19 lockdowns. Many also reported reduced stress and frustration about cooking, tried new recipes, and wasted less food. The findings are based on online responses given by 11,000 people in 11 countries. Australia, Belgium, Chile, Uganda, the Netherlands, France, Austria, Greece, Canada, Brazil, and Ireland. The study conducted by the University of Antwerp in Belgium, is set to be expanded to 25 more countries, with the final results expected by the end of June. Charlotte de Becker, who led the study, pointed out that people often eat more salty, fatty, and sugary foods when they are stressed. But instead of buying them, this need was met during lockdowns with home baking. Researchers believe that the healthier food choices could be a result of careful planning as people try to reduce the amount of time they spend in supermarkets. If you make a shopping list, you plan your meals ahead and you are less likely to add unhealthy food, Debacker said. However, Debacker suggests that the healthy eating habits people have adopted during the, the pandemic are likely to continue when life goes back to normal because lockdowns in most countries lasted for more than six weeks, the amount of time it usually takes to form a new habit. New octopus seen seven kilometers below the surface. An octopus has been seen deeper in the ocean than ever before, at almost 7,000 meters below the surface. It was filmed at the bottom of the Java Trench in the Indian Ocean, 
about 1,800 meters deeper than the previous deepest sighting from 50 years ago. Researchers think the creature might be a new species of Dumbo octopus. The name Dumbo refers to fins the octopus has just above its eyes, which look similar to the ears of Dumbo, a cartoon elephant from a 1940s Disney movie. The octopus was identified by Dr. Alan Jamieson, who also saw another Dumbo octopus at about 5,700 meters deep in the same area. Both of the octopuses were spotted using landers, devices holding cameras and other equipment that are dropped by ships and sink to the ocean floor. Jamieson made the discovery as part of the Five Deeps expedition, where he is the chief scientist. It was the first manned expedition to the deepest parts of each of the world's five oceans. Jamieson said that the octopus sightings show there are still surprising discoveries to be made. Quite often you hear about new species and they tend to be tiny worms and small crustaceans, he said. This is a great big octopus. Jamieson told CNN that he hopes his discovery would show people that not all deep sea creatures are scary, weird, and monstrous. This is just a cute little octopus doing what octopuses do. There's nothing particularly weird about it, he said. The Five Deeps expedition was led by Victor Vescovo, an explorer and businessman who also set a number of deep dive records by the time the expedition ended in September 2019. Vescovo became the first person to dive to the deepest points of all five of the world's oceans and the first ever person to reach the deepest points of the Southern Ocean, the Indian Ocean, and the Arctic Ocean. New octopus seen seven kilometers below the surface. An octopus has been seen deeper in the ocean than ever before, at almost 7,000 meters below the surface. It was filmed at the bottom of the Java Trench in the Indian Ocean, about 1,800 meters deep, deeper than the previous deepest sightings from 50 years ago. 
researchers think the creature might be a new species of Dumbo octopus. The name Dumbo refers to fins the octopus has just above its eyes, which look similar to the ears of Dumbo, a cartoon elephant from a 1940s Disney movie. The octopus was identified by Dr. Alan Jamieson, who also saw another Dumbo octopus at about 5,700 meters deep in the same area. Both of the octopuses were spotted using landers, devices holding cameras and other equipment that are dropped by ships and sink to the ocean floor. Jamieson made the discovery as part of the Five Deeps expedition, where he is the chief scientist. It was the first manned expedition to the deepest parts of each of the world's five oceans. Jamieson said that the octopus sighting showed there are still surprising discoveries to be made. Quite often you hear about new species and they tend to be tiny worms and small crustaceans, he said. This is a great big octopus. Jamieson told CNN that he hopes his discovery would show people that not all deep sea creatures are scary, weird, and monstrous. This is just a cute little octopus doing what octopuses do. There's nothing particularly weird about it, he said. The Five Deeps expedition was led by Victor Vescovo, an explorer and businessman who also set a number of deep dive records by the time the expedition ended in September 2019. Vescovo became the first person to dive to the deepest points of all five of the world's oceans, and the first ever person to reach the deepest points of the Southern Ocean, the Indian Ocean, and the Arctic Ocean. Population of world's rarest ape triples. The population of the world's rarest ape the Hainan gibbon has tripled. There were only 10 in 1970, which has now increased to 30 in 2020. They live only on Hainan Island, China. That increase may seem small, but the gibbons give birth only once every two years. Most of the progress has happened since a conservation project was started in 2003, when there were only 13 Hainan gibbons in the wild. Until recently, the gibbons were only able to live in about 15 square kilometers of their 300 square kilometer forest. This was because so much had been cut down that different parts of the forest were no longer connected. Kadori Conservation China, KCC, has now planted over 80,000 big and lighty trees to join different gibbon groups together and help provide them with food. Our biggest goal now is to help expand the Gibbons territory so the whole species won't be wiped out if natural disasters occur, KCC Philip Low Yipfui told the South China Morning Post. There used to be thousands of Gibbons 
on Hyman Island, but they have been impacted by habitat loss and poaching. To prevent poaching, the KFBG is helping local villagers make money from other things like farming pigs or beekeeping. They have also hired local men to be rangers and used former hunters' knowledge of the forest to help protect the gibbons they once hunted. We try and instill a sense of pride in the locals and the ex-hunters are really satisfied with their work now, Lowe said. That is the main point of conservation work. It's just as much about the people. Population of world's rarest ape triples. The population of the world's rarest ape, the Heinen gibbon, has tripled. There were only 10 in 1970, which has now increased to 30 in 2020. They live only on Hainan Island, China. That increase may seem small, but the gibbons give birth only once every two years. Most of the progress has happened since a conservation project was started in 2003, when there were only 13 Heinen gibbons in the wild. Until recently, the gibbons were only able to live in about 15 square kilometers of their 300 square kilometer forest. This was because so much had been cut down that different parts of the forest were no longer connected. Kadori Conservation China, KCC, has now planted over 80,000 fig and lychee trees to join different given groups together and help provide them with food. Our biggest goal now is to help expand the gibbons territory so the whole species won't be wiped out if natural disasters occur, KCC's Philip Lo Yikui told the South China Morning Post. There used to be thousands of gibbons on Hainan Island, but they have been impacted by habitat loss and poaching. To prevent poaching, the KFBG is helping local villagers make money from other things like farming pigs or beekeeping. They have also hired local men to be rangers and used former hunters' knowledge of the forest to help protect the gibbons they once hunted. We try and instill a sense of pride in the locals, and the ex-hunters are really satisfied with their work now, Lowe said. That is the main point of conservation work. It's just as much about the people. Italian woman stuffs olives during brain surgery. A 60-year-old Italian woman prepared traditional stuffed olives as surgeons worked to remove a tumor from her brain last week. The woman was having awake brain surgery where the patient is awake while surgery is being carried out on parts of the brain that controls things like vision, movement, and speech. To help the surgeon avoid any serious mistakes, the patient K 
can be asked questions during the operation or given a task to do. CBS News reports that the woman prepared 90 Escoli style olives, a specialty of Italy's Marche region, in less than an hour. The dish is prepared by filling green olives with meat and cheese. They are then covered in flour, egg, and breadcrumbs before being fried in olive oil. The surgeon, Roberto Trignani, has carried out around 60 similar operations over the last five years. The activity is chosen based on the part of the brain that is being worked on. For the Italian woman, it was the part that controls speech and complex movements. Trignani told Italian media that he spoke to the patient about finding an activity that needed fast hand movements and they chose the olive recipe. She also answered questions during the operation and shared a few recipes with the team of 11 medical staff. Trignani also had a patient who was asked to watch cartoons during surgery. While he worked on the part of their brain that controls vision. Other patients have been asked to sing or play musical instruments, such as the guitar or the violin. Italian woman stuffs olives during brain surgery. A 60-year-old Italian woman prepared traditional stuffed olives as surgeons worked to remove a tumor from her brain last week. The woman was having awake brain surgery where the patient is awake while surgery is being carried out on parts of the brain that control things like vision, movement, and speech. To help the surgeon avoid any serious mistakes, the patient can be asked questions during the operation or given a task to do. CBS News reports that the woman prepared 90 Escoli style olives, a specialty of Italy's Marche region, in less than an hour. The dish is prepared by filling green olives with meat and cheese. They are then covered in flour egg, and breadcrumbs before being fried in olive oil. The surgeon, Roberto Trignani, has carried out around 60 similar operations over the last five years. The activity is chosen based on the part of the brain that is being worked on. For the Italian woman, it was the part that controls speech and complex movements. Trignani told Italian media that he spoke to the patient about finding an activity that needed fast hand movements, and they chose the olive recipe. She also answered questions during the operation and shared a few recipes with the team of 11 medical staff. 
Trignani also had a patient who was asked to watch cartoons during surgery while he worked on the part of their brain that controls vision. Other patients have been asked to sing or play musical instruments, such as the guitar or the violin. Gloves translate sign language into speech. Researchers from University of California, Los Angeles, have made gloves that can translate American Sign Language, ASL, the language used by many deaf people in North America, into English speech. The gloves use sensors to detect hand movements and communicate with an the app then translates these movements into words and speaks them out loud in English. Our hope is that this opens up an easy way for people who use sign language to communicate directly with non-signers without needing someone else to translate for them, said lead researcher Jun Chin of the Samuel School of Engineering. In tests, the technology was able to detect 660 signs and translate them in under one second per word. It was correct almost 99% of the time. Researchers also added sensors to people's faces which detected their expressions. Expressions are used to change or affect the meaning of signs in ASL. Chin said that other technology used to translate ASL is heavy and uncomfortable. The new gloves, however, are light and flexible. But Gabrielle Hodge, a deaf researcher at University College London, told CNN that the technology is not needed. This is because Many deaf people already use text-to-speech apps on their phones, use gestures, or write what they want to say with pen and paper. The World Health Organization says that there are 466 million people in the world with disabling hearing loss. It's estimated that between 100,000 and 1 million people use ASL as their main language. Gloves translate sign language into speech. Researchers from University of California, Los Angeles, have made gloves that can translate American Sign Language, ASL, the language used by many deaf people in North America, into English speech. 
The gloves use sensors to detect hand movement and communicate with an app. The app then translates these movements into words and speaks them out loud in English. Our hope is that this opens up an easy way for people who use sign language to communicate directly with non-signers without needing someone else to translate for them, said lead researcher Yun Chin of the Samueli School of Engineering. In tests, the technology was able to detect 660 signs and translate them in under one second per word. It was correct almost 99% of the time. Researchers also added sensors to people's faces, which detected their expressions. Expressions are used to change or affect the meaning of signs in ASL. Chin said that other technology used to translate ASL is heavy and uncomfortable. The new gloves, however, are light and flexible. But Gabrielle Hodge, a deaf researcher at University College London, told CNN that the technology is not needed. This is because many deaf people already use text-to-speech apps on their phones, use gestures, or write what they want to say with pen and paper. The World Health Organization says that there are 466 million people in the world with disabling hearing loss. It's estimated that between 100,000 and 1 million people use ASL as their main language. Fundraiser recreates NASA's Smell of Space perfume. A perfume made by NASA that smells like space is now available to the public. Steve Percy, CEO of Omega Ingredients, creates natural flavors for the food industry. In 2008, NASA asked him to make them a perfume that smells like space, which they used when training astronauts to help them get used to the smell before going into space. Astronauts have described the smell of space as being like cooked steak, burned cookies, raspberries, and rum. Peggy Whitsum told CNN that fellow astronaut Valerie Corzum said it smells like the smell from a gun right after you fire the shot. In June 2020, a Kickstarter campaign was started to raise money to make the perfume again for anyone to try. At first, the goal was to raise around $2,000, which happened in under 24 hours. The project has raised over $450,000 so far. People can donate money to the project to get bottles of the perfume for themselves, or they can donate bottles to schools. The team hopes that the product will get more children interested in STEM subjects, science, technology, engineering, and math. For each donation to the project, the team will donate 
to a STEM program in a school. The perfume will be made in the UK, but delivered worldwide. Even though it was made to be used for education, it is safe to wear as a normal perfume for anyone who likes the smell. The team behind the idea hope to release more products in the future. Fundraiser recreates NASA's Smell of Space perfume. A perfume made by NASA that smells like space is now available to the public. Steve Percy, CEO of Omega Ingredients, creates natural flavors for the food industry. In 2008, NASA asked him to make them a perfume that smells like space, which they used when training astronauts to help them get used to the smell before going into space. Astronauts have described the smell of space as being like cooked steak, burned cookies, raspberries, and rum. Peggy Whitson told CNN that fellow astronaut Valerie Corson said it smells like the smell from a gun right after you fire the shot. In June 2020, a Kickstarter campaign was started to raise money to make the perfume again for anyone to try. At first, the goal was to raise around $2,000, which happened in under 24 hours. The project has raised over $450,000 so far. People can donate money to the project to get bottles of the perfume for themselves, or they can donate bottles to schools. The team hopes that the product will get more children interested in STEM subjects, science, technology, engineering, and math. For each donation to the project, the team will donate to a STEM program in a school. The perfume will be made in the UK, but delivered worldwide. Even though it was made to be used for education, it is safe to wear as a normal perfume for anyone who likes the smell. The team behind the idea hope to release more products in the future. Balloon to fly tourists to edge of space. Two companies, space Perspective and Priestman Good are working together to make a balloon that will fly passengers to the edge of space. The balloon, known as Spaceship Neptune, will use hydrogen to float up over 30 kilometers more than twice as high as a passenger plane. Below the balloon, there's a capsule with seats for eight passengers and one pilot. Nigel Good, designer and co-founder of Priestman Good, said that the companies want to make the journey as comfortable as possible for passengers. There's a bar and a bathroom, plus large windows so passengers can see space and the earth below. They'll even be able to share the experience on social media while on board. The journey will take six hours in total. It will take two hours for the balloon to float to the edge of space, where it will stay for two hours. It will then 
return to Earth and land in the ocean where a boat will collect it. Space Perspective says that it hopes the experience will be as easy as boarding a plane. The first flights will leave from Space Perspective's control center in Florida, but there are plans to have more flights from Hawaii, Alaska, and possibly other places outside of the U.S. The companies hope that the balloon will be used for experiments by scientists and for events like weddings, concerts, and business meetings. The first test flight is planned for early 2021, but won't include any passengers. The companies hope to eventually offer up to 100 flights per year. Balloon to fly tourists to edge of space. Two companies, Space Perspective and Priestman Good, are working together to make a balloon that will fly passengers to the edge of space. The balloon, known as Spaceship Neptune, will use hydrogen to float up over 30 kilometers, more than twice as high as a passenger plane. Below the balloon, there's a capsule with seats for eight passengers and one pilot. Nigel Good, designer and co-founder of Priestman Good, said that the companies want to make the journey as comfortable as possible for passengers. There's a bar and a bathroom, plus large windows so passengers can see space and the earth below. They'll even be able to share the experience on social media while on board. The journey will take six hours in total. It will take two hours from the balloon to float to the edge of space, where it will stay for two hours. It will then return to Earth and land in the ocean, where a boat will collect it. Space Perspective says that it hopes the experience will be as easy as boarding a plane. The first flights will leave from Space Perspective's control center in Florida, but there are plans to have more flights from Hawaii, Alaska, and possibly other places outside of the U.S. The companies hope that the balloon will be used for experiments by scientists and for events like weddings, concerts, and business meetings. The first test flight is planned for early 2021, but won't include any passengers. The companies hope to eventually offer up to 100 flights per year. Burger King Fights Climate Change by Changing Cows' Diets Burger King has changed the diet of some of the cows in its supply chain, saying that it will reduce their daily methane emissions by around 33%. The company worked with scientists at the Autonomous University at the State of Mexico and at the University of California to develop the new diet. Tests found that adding 100 grams of lemongrass leaves to their daily diet helps cows release less methane, a greenhouse gas, as they digest. The Environmental Protection Agency says that 9.9% .9 
of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions in 2018 came from the agriculture industry and methane emissions from animals made up more than a quarter of those emissions. A recent survey found that about two-thirds of Americans think corporations have a responsibility to fight climate change. Americans are also eating less meat for both health and environmental reasons. Two years ago, McDonald's also said it was taking steps to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and changed how the beef in its Big Macs and Quarter Pounders was produced. It said at the time that it expected the changes to prevent 150 million metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions from being released by 2030. Both Burger King and McDonald's have been adding more meat-free options to their menus too. Burger King has started selling its reduced methane emissions beef whopper burger made with beef from cows that emit less methane in a small number of its restaurants in Miami, New York, Austin, Portland, and Los Angeles. Burger King fights climate change by changing cows' diets. Burger King has changed the diet of some of the cows in its supply chain, saying that it will reduce their daily methane emissions by around 33%. The company worked with scientists at the Autonomous University at the State of Mexico and at the University of California to develop the new diet. Tests found that adding 100 grams of lemongrass leaves to their daily diet helps cows release less methane, a greenhouse gas, as they digest. The Environmental Protection Agency says that 9.9% of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions in 2018 came from the agriculture industry and methane emissions from animals made up more than a quarter of those emissions. A recent survey found that about two thirds of Americans think corporations have a responsibility to fight climate change. Americans are also eating less meat for both health and environmental reasons. Two years ago, McDonald's also said it was taking steps to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and changed how the beef in its Big Macs and Quarter Pounders was produced. It said at the time that it expected the changes to prevent 150 million metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions from being released by 2030. Both Burger King and McDonald's have been adding more meat-free options to their menus too. Burger King has started selling its reduced methane emissions beef Whopper burger made with beef from cows that emit less methane in a small number of its restaurants in Miami, New York, Austin, Portland, and Los Angeles. Fujitsu staff can work from home from now on. While workers are returning to offices in some countries around the world. Japanese company Fujitsu is allowing its employees to work from home from now on. The change will allow around 80,000 Fujitsu workers to choose their own work hours and 
where to work, depending on the needs of their job and their lifestyle, the company said. It's part of the company's work-life shift plan, which is a reaction to the changes in daily life societies are now facing following the worst of COVID-19, which some are calling the new normal. For some countries, like the U.S. and U.K., the new normal includes working from home, using face masks, and social distancing plans in public spaces, including restaurants, schools, and offices. Fujitsu's plan should reduce the number of people in each office, making it easier to work under social distancing guidelines. The company plans to reduce its office space by 50% by 2022 and will also start using hot desking where people don't use the same desk every day. This is yet another sign that everything we know about offices and the future of work is being upended. Tech journalist Shri Trevinson told BBC, thousands of employers and millions of employees are learning the pros and cons of the new normal. Tech giants Google and Facebook are allowing employees to work wherever they choose for the rest of the year. And in May, Twitter told its employees they could work from home for as long as they wanted. Fujitsu staff can work from home from now on. While workers are returning to offices in some countries around the world, Japanese company Fujitsu is allowing its employees to work from home from now on. The change will allow around 80,000 Fujitsu workers to choose their own work hours and where to work, depending on the needs of their job and their lifestyle, the company said. It's part of the company's work-life shift plan, which is a reaction to the changes in daily life societies are now facing allowing, following the worst of COVID-19, which some are calling the new normal. For some countries, like the US and UK, the new normal includes working from home, using face masks, and social distancing plans in public spaces including restaurants, schools, and offices. Fujitsu's plan should reduce the number of people in each office, making it easier to work under social distancing guidelines. The company plans to reduce its office space by 50% by 2022, and will also start using hot desking, where people don't use the same desk every day. This is yet another sign that everything we know about offices and the future of work is being upended. Tech journalist Shri Trevinson told BBC, thousands of employers and millions of employees are learning the pros and cons of the new normal. Tech giants Google and Facebook are allowing employees to work wherever they choose for the rest of the year. And in May, Twitter told its employees they could work from home for as long as they wanted. 
Would you sleep in a floating tent? The shoal tent by Smithfly, an American outdoor equipment company, is the world's first inflatable floating tent. Combining a raft with a tent, it's designed to let people sleep while floating on the water. First sold in October 2017, the $1,999 tent weighs about 34 kilograms. It doesn't need any tent poles to hold it up and instead uses inflatable tubes. The square tent has 2.4 meter long sides, so there's enough room for someone up to 1.9 meters tall to sleep inside. The sides of the tent are also easy to remove, which makes it easier for someone to get out quickly if they need to. Smithfly was started by Ethan Smith in 2011 using a $10,000 loan from his bank. He told CNBC he started the company because he was worried he might lose his job after the 2008-9 global financial crisis. He started by selling fishing equipment while still working at his other job. When the Shoal tent was first sold, it was much more popular than Smith thought it would be. Videos of the product got over 20 million views on Facebook, and he told CNBC that he sold three times more tents than he had expected. Smithfly doesn't have a patent on the tent, which means other companies could copy it. But Smith said he plans to stay ahead of the competition by continuing to think of new ideas. Would you sleep on a floating tent? The Shoal Tent by Smithfly, an American outdoor equipment company, is the world's first inflatable floating tent. Combining a raft with a tent, it's designed to let people sleep while floating on the water. First sold in October 2017, the $1,999 tent weighs about 34 kilograms. It doesn't need any tent poles to hold it up and instead uses inflatable tubes. The square tent has 2.4 meter long sides, so there's enough room for someone up to 1.9 meters tall to sleep inside. The sides of the tent are also easy to remove, which makes it easier for someone to get out quickly if they need to. Smithfly was started by Ethan Smith in 2011 using a $10,000 loan from his bank. He told CNBC he started the company because he was worried he might lose his job after the 2008-9 global financial crisis. He started by selling fishing equipment while still working at his other job. When the Shoal tent was first sold, it was much more popular than Smith thought it would be. Videos of the product got over 20 million views on Facebook he told CNBC that he sold three times more tents than he had expected. 
Smithfly doesn't have a patent on the tent, which means other companies could copy it. But Smith said he plans to stay ahead of the competition by continuing to think of new ideas. Robots could replace real dolphins in aquariums. Edge Innovations of San Francisco has made a robot dolphin that looks and moves like the real thing. The dolphin robot can swim and dive on its own, or a human can make it move with a remote control. Melanie Langlotz, who is working on the project, told the Guardian that people could not guess that the robot wasn't a real dolphin during a test. Edge Innovations says the robot could be used in aquariums, marine parks, museums, and shopping malls. The company's Li Wong told the Guardian that an aquarium in China is already thinking about using them instead of real dolphins. The company has made robot animals for Universal Studios, Disney parks, and movies like Free Willy and Deep Blue Sea. Roger Holzberg, who used to be creative director at the Walt Disney Company, is one of the designers. He told the Guardian that marine parks are making less money as people worry more about the health and safety of the animals. The UK charity Whale and Dolphin Conservation has found that bottlenose dolphins in captivity live fewer than 13 years on average compared to 30 to 50 years in the wild. One robot dolphin will cost almost $27 million. Wong said this is four times what a real dolphin costs, but the robot will last longer and be easier and less expensive to look after. Edge Innovations has said it could also make other robot animals such as sharks or sea dragons in the future. Robots could replace real dolphins in aquariums. Edge Innovations of San Francisco has made a robot dolphin that looks and moves like the real thing. The dolphin robot can swim and dive on its own, or a human can make it move with a remote control. Melanie Langlotz, who was working on the project, told The Guardian that people could not guess that the robot wasn't a real dolphin during a test. Edge Innovation says the robot could be used in aquariums, marine parks, museums, and shopping malls. 
The company's Li Wang told The Guardian that an aquarium in China is already thinking about using them instead of real dolphins. The company has made robot animals for Universal Studios, Disney parks, and movies like Free Willy and Deep Blue Sea. Roger Holzberg, who used to be creative director at the Walt Disney Company, is one of the designers. He told The Guardian that marine parks are making less money as people worry more about the health and safety of the animals. The UK charity Whale and Dolphin Conservation has found that bottlenose dolphins in captivity live fewer than 13 years on average, compared to 30 to 50 years in the wild. One robot dolphin will cost almost $27 million. Wong said this is four times what a real dolphin costs. But the robot will last longer and be easier and less expensive to look after. Edge Innovations has said it could also make other robot animals, such as sharks or sea dragons, in the future. Twitter tests tool to stop users sharing unread links. Twitter has been testing a new tool on Android devices that asks users if they are sure they want to share links they have not opened and read. Twitter wrote on its own account, sharing an article can spark conversation, so you may want to read it before you tweet it. It added that users will still be able to choose to share the link even if they don't read it, and that the tool has been made to encourage informed discussion. In 2016, researchers from Columbia University and the Microsoft Research INRI Joint Center found that 59% of links shared on Twitter had never been clicked, meaning a lot of people were sharing without reading. People are more willing to share an article than read it, said one of the study's authors, Arnaud Leguf. He added that this had become the normal way people consume information today. People form an opinion based on a summary or a summary of summaries without making the effort to go deeper. Satire website The Science Post also posted an article in 2018 with the headline study. 70% of Facebook users only read the headline of science stories before commenting. The joke was that after the first paragraph, the article was just lorem ipsum. Text that doesn't mean anything, used to fill the space where real text will later be put in a document. The article has now been shared more than 190,000 times.
Twitter test tool to stop users sharing unread links. Twitter has been testing a new tool on Android devices that asks users if they are sure they want to share links they have not opened and read. Twitter wrote on its own account, sharing an article can spark conversation, so you may want to read it before you tweet it. It added that users will still be able to choose to share the link even if they don't read it, and that the tool has been made to encourage informed discussion. In 2016, researchers from Columbia University and the Microsoft Research INRIA Joint Center found that 59% of links shared on Twitter had never been clicked, meaning a lot of people were sharing without reading. People are more willing to share an article than read it, said one of the study's authors, Arnaud Lou. He added that this had been, become the normal way people consume information today. People form an opinion based on a summary or a summary of summaries without making the effort to go deeper. Satire website, The Science Post, also posted an article in 2018 with the headline, Study, 70% of Facebook users only read the headline of science stories before commenting. The joke was that after the first paragraph, the article was just Lorem Ipsum, text that doesn't mean anything, used to fill in the space where real text will later be put in a document. The article has now been shared more than 190,000 times. 